Good morning. My name is Ronald White. I'm the Dean of the University of Baltimore School of Law. And it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this, the 12th annual Feminist Legal Theory Conference, sponsored by our law school's Center on Applied Feminism. Now, I would so much rather be welcoming you inside this beautiful building that you see projected behind me. I'm not really standing outside the building, um, but uh, we would have uh, welcomed you with open arms and some morning coffee uh, here at our beautiful contemporary law school building. Instead, we're making the best of uh, the bad situation and we find ourselves on Zoom, but the work continues. And the important work of our Center on Applied Feminism continues this morning at this 12th annual conference. The University of Baltimore Law School's Center on Applied Feminism is, we believe, unique in the legal academy. Uh, it is a very important contribution to our work at the School of Law, uh, but also uh, nationally, to take legal issues and view them through the lens of feminist theory and to take these policy issues and uh, take a practical applied approach to them uh, with the benefit of feminist legal theory uh, uh, thinking. Uh, so for many years, the center has examined different issues <clears throat> at this annual symposium. And this year, uh, our topic is applied feminism and privacy. I want to thank the two co-directors of the center, my colleagues on the University of Baltimore Law School faculty, Michelle Gilman and Margaret Johnson. They have done fabulous work, even under the difficult circumstances this year, in convening national experts to examine these important topics, and this year, the especially important topic of privacy. Last evening, or yesterday afternoon and evening, uh, there were important panels on menstrual justice and other issues that relate to feminism and privacy. And today's panels uh, will look at many different aspects of privacy through the lens of feminist legal theory. I'm so glad that so many of you are joining us today. Uh, this is a conference that has always attracted wide attention. And of course, one benefit of the Zoom world that we live in is that people can join from near and far. Um, so thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for contributing to the work of our Center on Applied Feminism. Uh, I urge you to uh, uh, continue to, to work with us, even in the years ahead as we come back into uh, the live world. Um, but certainly today, uh, enjoy, and I hope you get much out of this important convening. So with that, I'll turn the uh, program back to Professors Gilman and uh, Johnson uh, to uh, speak about today's program. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dean Weish. Uh, we really appreciate your stalwart support of the Center on Applied Feminism. Certainly this conference every year could not exist without your support, so thank you. Um, in addition to what uh, Dean Weish mentioned, it's really important to understand that our center takes an intersectional approach to feminist legal theory. And, no time is more important to underscore this than what we have been living through this year in the pandemic with uh, the racialized killings of black men and women due to police violence. And just like Black Lives Matter is an applied approach to a legal theory, critical race theory, understanding the systemic racism of police forces and our government and our structures, so too is Say Her Name, uh, which is an intersectional movement looking at the vi police violence towards black women, uh, which again is taking critical race feminist legal theory and applying it uh, to what's happening in the world. So we stand in solidarity, especially this week, um, but always. So, <clears throat> In addition, those movements not only show the importance of intersectionality, but also that movements can create change, that theory and practice can combine together to hopefully change our society towards more social justice. Today's conference presenters' papers interrogate the topic of applied feminism and privacy. 
And we expect no less that these ideas in papers and presentations will soon draw fruition in practice that we hope will also help us achieve uh, greater social justice. Each year, Michelle Gilman, um, my co-director for the Center on Applied Feminism, each year she and I meet over the summer to plan out the next spring's conference and pick a theme. I have been so inspired by Michelle's work on privacy at the intersection of class, and gender and race that I knew this year, well, actually it was last year because we planned two years ago, but it's a little delayed, a time warp. But I knew that this year's theme had to be applied feminism and privacy. And Michelle graciously agreed with my idea. Thanks to our pre presenters who have patiently waited for this conference, we selected your papers over a year and a half ago. <laughs> and then, we didn't want to cancel it, uh, but then COVID made it clear we had to cancel it. We thought we could reschedule it for September 2020. That didn't work out. We are so delighted we are able to hold this here today and have so many of our original presenters be able to make it. And I want to thank all of you for attending. No doubt some of you have been coming to these conferences for the 14 years that we've been holding them. We appreciate the fact that this is a free conference open to the entire community. And this year more than ever with over a hundred attendees last night, we know that we have a broad audience and we appreciate you always attending and participating. It's one of the things we love about this conference. As you can see, we chose to do the Zoom room format rather than a webinar because the community building of this conference is key. And we hope you will use the chat feature not only to chat to the moderator of each panel to ask questions of the presenters, but to DM each other and make connections. We also have two breakout rooms during the day that uh, Professor Gilman will explain more about later that we hope will also foster the sense of community that we so cherish when we're in person. <clears throat> to our Dean, as I said before, also to Chris Stutz, Lori Schnitzer, Jared Schuster, our Center on Applied Feminism student associates, especially Paulina Tanuski and Shay Rudberg, who helped select the papers two years ago for today. This conference is able to continue year after year because of your support. And to the Law Review Board, because we co-sponsor with the Law Review, another wonderful thing we enjoy because they publish a volume dedicated to this conference each year. To the Law Review Board from last year, who graduated without seeing this conference come to fruition, especially Elizabeth Strunk, Sumbul Alam, and Alana Glover. Thank you for all of your work in creating the volume and again, selecting the papers that we will hear from today. And I also wanna thank this year's amazing board and membership of the Law Review. Uh, for those of you who attended last night, you saw the Law Review students were using their amazing research tools to put in the chat different papers that people had written or other news articles about the work so that we could all expand our learning about menstrual justice. And today I expect will be no different. And before I turn it over to uh, the editor in chief and symposium editor of the Law Review, I wanna just let you know that if you use hashtag feminism privacy, if you're going to tweet about the conference, which we would encourage you to do, we will all be able to follow the thread and enjoy the further conversation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce JJ Lucido, who is the editor in chief of the University of Baltimore Law Review and Christian Coward, who is the symposium editor, who will also join me and the Dean in welcoming you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Professor Johnson. Welcome everyone to today's conference on applied feminism and privacy. As you just heard, my name is JJ Lucido. For those of you who do not know me, I am a third year day student serving as the editor in chief of Law Review at the University of Baltimore School of Law. In the interest of time, I will be brief. First, I must offer my thanks to those who made today possible. Thank you, Dean Weich and Professor Johnson for starting today's events with such powerful remarks. 
Thank you to Professor Gilman as well for your work to make this event a reality. Thank you to the Center on Applied Feminism and its leaders for all your work on this event and within our community. The programming of this event is simply exceptional and I'm so thrilled we can make this a reality. Echoing Professor Gilman, I want to thank our executive board from last year for their work on this event as well. Thank you to our symposium editor, Christian Coward, for his work on facilitating this conference. I want to thank all of today's speakers and authors, the members of our journal assisting with the programming of today's conference, and each person in attendance for your time. Finally, thank you to the University of Baltimore School of Law for giving our journal the platform to host such meaningful events and publish our journal. For me, my first exposure to the concept of a symposium was in my Philosophy 101 course at Gettysburg College when we learned about its origins in Greek culture. As I made my way through academia, I have witnessed the power of this concept as it provides an exceptional way to gather, converse, and share ideas as part of a collective effort to shape the future. In the wake of the pandemic and in the midst of an ever-changing future, today presents a unique forum for us to examine privacy through the lens of feminist legal theories. After a very successful first day, I am so excited to see what today will bring. In the interest of keeping my promise to be brief and allowing enough time for today's speakers, I will end here and pass the baton to our symposium editor, Christian Coward. Thank you once again and enjoy the day. Good morning, all. My name is Christian Coward. I am the current symposium editor of Law Review. Um, taking on this role during a pandemic was very odd. I was unsure what it would really look like. Um, so to that point, I really want to congratulate Professor Gilman and Professor Johnson for successfully putting together this event. We worked tremendously hard to ensure this event would happen, and we've done so remotely. This is University of Baltimore's first ever remote symposium conference. Um, so it really is a blessing that we're here today. I would like to just um, say that they did a tremendous job last night, and I know today will be great as well. University of Baltimore Law Review was happy to support them and help them. You know, we have our research, but we also wanted to make sure we do things and monitor the chat just to ensure that this event goes through fluidly. So I'm just really grateful and honored that we had the opportunity to do this and work with you all. And um, thank you everyone, everyone for coming today. I hope you enjoy the panel discussions and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, JJ and Christian. And Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole McConlog, who is the moderator for the first panel, Controlling Personal Data in the Digital Age. Nicole is an Associate Professor of Law and Clinic Director at the West Virginia University College of Law and proudly one of our former uh, fellows. So welcome back, Nicole. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much. It's so great to see these familiar faces although some like Ron are less familiar with their COVID beards and all of that, um, but I'm so glad to be here with all of you. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get into it. Our panel is uh, Controlling Personal Data in the Digital Age. Um, and we've got three amazing presenters uh, that I'll introduce for you. Uh, the first is Kendra Albert, who's a clinical instructor at the Cyber Law Clinic, um, which teaches students to practice technology law. Uh, they also serve as the director for the initiative for uh, a representative First Amendment, which provides funding and support to his law students from backgrounds that are traditionally underrepresented in First Amendment law. Um, Albert also holds a law degree from Harvard Law School, serves on the board of the ACLU of Massachusetts, and as a legal advisor for hacking slash hustling. Uh, the next presenter will be Cynthia Conti Cook who's a civil rights attorney, legal researcher, and technologist studying the impact of technology on systems of and movements for justice. She's currently a technology fellow at the Ford Foundation, and before that led several strategic litigation projects at the Legal Aid Society of New York City's Special Litigation Unit. Conti Cook has led dozens of trainings and presentations to hundreds of attorneys nationwide and has spoken at multiple international conferences about the impact of technology on criminal justice systems. Um, her work's been featured in the New York Times, the American Bar Association, 
in the intercept and um, she's been very highly recognized including receiving one of the 2019 legal rebel awards from the aba our final panelist um, last but never least is lynn daggett um, who is the smith moore p myers chair and professor at gonzaga law school um, she's been uh, on the faculty since 1991 before uh, coming there she got a phd in educational psychology from Duke, um, conducting research about, administering programs for, and advocating for gifted students. Um, she earned her Juris Doctor, summa cum laude, from a University of Connecticut, uh, sorry, University of Connecticut Law School. Um, she then entered private practice in Connecticut, representing school districts in labor and employment, um, tort, civil rights, uh, constitutional matters, special education, and so forth. Um, currently, as a law professor, her focus naturally is on education law and its intersection with tort law. In addition to her full-time position, she works with Gonzaga School of Education on school law issues. Um, her published scholarship includes work in school tort liability, special education law, student privacy, civil rights, and legal education. She's a frequent conference professor, um, a, a conference presenter, and has received uh, Gonzaga's Burlington Northern Great Teachers Award. Um, so I'm very excited for this panel. We're going to be talking about a lot of um, issues that I think are going to be very relatable for everyone. Um, and so let's go ahead and get into it. Um, and if folks have questions, please feel free to, to enter those in the chat as we go along. Um, we will be leaving you know, about uh, 15 minutes or so for questions at the end. Um, so. Uh, uh, Kendra, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, honored to be here. Um, uh, uh, always a little stressed to figure out uh, screen sharing on Zoom, um, but you know it's a uh, mostly because of as a technology law person, I feel like it's a lot of pressure. But can you all see my slides? Awesome. All right. Well, so thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be on this panel. I want to sort of set expectations to note that although uh, the issues I'm talking about are certainly current ones, I actually, um, although I initially approached this project through the lens of thinking about it in kinds of in terms of personal data, it sort of morphed over time uh, to be sort of more of a kind of uh, uh, theoret some theoretical work. So just if you're like, why? When is the when is Kendra going to get to the part where they talk about um, you know, personal data gathering, like, spoiler, I'm not. Um, but that being said, super excited to be here today. Um, so I'm presenting some work that I call the double binds of transgender privacy. Um, and this is sort of about my uh, trying to understand sort of how transgender litigants are treated in cases where they are asserting privacy interests um, and how that can, what that can teach us both about privacy as like a concept, but also about the experience of transgender litigants in law more generally. Um, and I came to this topic because um, some of you may know this, but I didn't when I started. Um, there's actually a constitutional right to privacy for trans folks in the Second Circuit. So um, in a, a case called Powell v. Scriver Scri um, from 1999, every time I, I screw up that last name, um, uh, the, the court held in the context of a prisoner whose um, HIV status and transgender status had been revealed to guards to other prisoners without her permission they actually hold that there's a substantive due process right to privacy in one's transgender status, right? And this is the quote that I just really think is emblematic of what the court is doing here in this case. Um, they say individuals who have chosen to abandon one gender in favor of another understandably might desire to conduct their affairs as if such a transition was never necessary. This excruciatingly private and intimate nature of transsexualism for persons who wish to preserve privacy um, in this matter is really beyond debate, um, which is basically I read as judicial, uh, the judicial way of saying we don't have a case to cite. Um, but the, uh, so we have this sort of moment in privacy law where transgender status um, is actually seen as something where you do get a privacy interest, right? We have a recognition on a circuit level that that's true. And also, right, I think there are many transgender folks who do not feel like they have adequate control or privacy over parts of their gender. And you know, this work is sort of an attempt to reconcile or understand that. 
question. Um, and so what I did when, uh, in order to sort of figure that out is I basically read every single case I could find that had a trans litigant with where there was a privacy concern. So it turns out there's a lot of these because they show up in really strange places. So things from the substantive due process context, that's the Powell, uh, Powell case, but there's also tort claims. And Anita Allen wrote really, a uh, really amazing article of, and, I don't know, a long time ago at this point, um, where she talks about LGBT claims, um, including Diaz v. Oakland Tribune and Schuler v. McGraw-Hill companies. And I'll talk a little bit about Diaz later. But there's also things like motions to file litigation under a pseudonym, motions to publish or to not publish or seal a name change or to get a name change in the first place, um, motions to not provide medical records or seal medical records, and also privacy as an argument for making gender marker changes on identification. And this is sort of we, where we see it most recently, where a lot of the cases that um, impact litigation shops um, like the ACLU's uh, LGBT and HIV pos positive project have brought is um, use, use privacy as an, a, a relevant interest in order to get a gender marker change on a driver's license, for example. Finally, we also see privacy interests actually come up as part of broader anti-discrimination claims, things like in the mili military ban cases and HB2, um, in the unconstitutionality of anti-cross-dressing ordinances. You know, it's like everywhere. Um, but unfortunately, there, what I found once I started reviewing these cases is that transgender people who are seeking to use the law to gain control over their privacy are stuck. Um, and that's because uh, of a fundamental tension in the case law um, between, on the one hand, cisnormativity, and the other hand, transnormativity. So what's in the case law with regards to cisnormativity? What is this, like, how can we understand how cisnormativity is manifesting in this particular case law? So for folks who are unfamiliar with the term, I think of cisnormativity as a set of beliefs about gender, right? So gender as binary, right? There are two genders, male and female, or men and women, that it's fixed, right? You, you get one gender and you have it for your entire life. Um, that it aligns with assigned sex at birth. So if uh, when you're born, a doctor says it's a boy based on the uh, size of your erectile genital tissue, you're going to be, uh, you're going to grow up to be a man. Um, and then finally, and this one I think is really is also is really important, although sometimes overlooked, that it's obvious gender is obvious from presentation. So if you dress femininely, you're a woman, um, and if you dress masculinely, you're a man, and that that's like just clear, right? That's that's how we determine gender is based on presentation. So you know, the this is sort of a way. These are the ways this normativity. Um, manifest more broadly, it definitely, you definitely see these in the case law, um, but more sort of uh, generally, I think it can also be understood as thinking of transsexuality or being transgender as aberrational um, and best avoided, right? That there, it's a state of exception um, that is sort of confusing, but maybe there are some people who, who don't fit into these categories, but they're sort of social emergencies, right? Or special cases. Um, and a lot of, I think, what modern trans movement work has been has been is pushing back on this idea of the social emergency or the special case. But I still think that's one of the fundamental premises of um, cis normativity. So because all of these things are true, right, which is to say that or because society believes these things are true, a privacy interest in one's gender or aspects of one's experience of gender are something to be proved. There's sort of a baseline assumption once you take all of the cisnormativity stuff into account that gender is public, right? That's what we get when we think about it as obvious from presentation and that therefore gender information is something where there is a particular privacy. If you have a particular privacy interest in it, that's an aberrational state that needs to be justified. So I'm actually not gonna go through cases that show this because frankly, like I could do that for the entire rest of this conference. And that's probably not particularly interesting to folks. So I wanna focus on the stuff that I think is sort of novel, um, which is what I see as the flip side of cisnormativity, which is a concept called transnormativity. 
So trans normativity comes from the scholarship of a uh, uh, trans man named Austin Johnson, and he coined it to describe how transgender folks' presentation and experiences of gender are held accountable. In particular, how the lens of a binary medical model structures transgender experience. So how Johnson came up with this and identified this is he um, reviewed a number of documentary films about primarily white trans men um, and sort of looked at how those films articulated what it was to be trans, right? What, what made these folks trans? What experiences they, did they talk about as relevant? What, be, what bits of those identities were came up? And um, what he found is that there's sort of this primacy of a born in the wrong body narrative, right? Um, and you can hear this and see this in a billion different places, but if you, if you haven't seen it before, um, I'll show some examples, but I will also encourage you to literally read like Caitlyn Jenner's coming out interview, right? It's, it's there. Um, this idea that, you know, trans folks, real trans folks know early on in their lives that something is wrong and they spend their lives trying to fix it often through medical um, intervention. So when we look at transnormativity in the context of the cases, we can see it actually coming from, I think, well-meaning efforts at inclusion. I don't, it, transnormativity is actually way more common in cases that come out in favor of trans folks than it is in, in cases that come out against them um, because it's a way of evaluating someone's internalized gender claims. Um, it's a way of providing expert evidence about gender. Um, you know, you get a surgeon to testify, you get a psychologist to testify, you testify that this person knew for a really long time. Um, and it also shows up as literal medical requirements. So, you know, if you want to get the uh, sex on your driver's license change, and you know, you are required to get surgery to do so. Uh, that's a pretty clear sign that the law is transnormative because it's literally saying you can't qualify to be a different gender unless you have had medical transition. Um, and it used the use of medical transition in particular as a sign of realness is something that we really see um, sort of historically, but also even in present cases. There's an, also an implicit favoring of binary legible gender identities um, that are what, uh, to use the language of um, psychologists, consistent, insistent, and persistent, right? Which is to say that they, they travel backwards in time and that they are um, consistent from moment to moment, which is just, you know, this is probably obvious, but not aligned with everyone's experience of gender at all. Um, then finally, the ultimate test of being transgender under a transformative model is one's desire and to some extent one's ability to take medical transition steps. And what that means is that transformativity as a phenomenon and as an organizing principle for law has um, race and class-based out like outcomes, which is to say that both because medical transition is expensive, even if it's covered by your health insurance, and because like the medical system can be incredibly racist, um, there are like there's a, there's actual um, distributive outcomes for requiring or thinking of medical professionals as gatekeepers to transits. The other thing I want to note here is this can be really um, very specific in ways that I think can be uh, not necessarily obvious to outsiders who haven't um, who haven't spent a lot of time understanding trans uh, med how trans folks are treated by medicine. So let me give a very specific example, which is for certain types of transition surgeries, many physicians have a upper BMI cutoff. So for um, masculinizing top surgery, if you're over a certain weight, um, there are a lot of surgeons who just won't work on you um, because they claim either that, that it's too risky or because that they claim that it will, um, you won't get the results that you'll be happy with, et cetera, et cetera. And what that means in practice is to the extent that success in legal cases and or documentation changes is dependent upon surgery, you basically now have created like anti-fatness as a like underlying principle of the law by uh, importing medical criteria. And I think that that's a very specific example that tried, I think illustrates the way in which transnormativity as an organizing principle creates some really weird outcomes. Um, 
And this is the double bind, right? Which is, or one of them at least, which is the most successful narratives and cases to push back against this normativity are profoundly transformative. They invoke these very specific ideas of what it means to be trans and what medicalization, what role medicalization plays um, in, uh, uh, in, order to, um, in order to sort of discipline folks. So I'll provide a sort of brief example as I wrap up. Um, I mentioned Diaz v. Oakland Tribune. This is a case involved in from 19, the 1980s involving a trans woman who is outed by the Oakland Tribune. Um, and uh, she sues the Oakland Tribune for outing her. She's one of these uh, women from the 1960s and 70s that were served by the Stanford Gender Identity Clinics. And so she, it, this is in the, the opinion, she received bottom surgery in 1975. And the court actually cites her testimony of like, born in the wrong body, her outward appearance, her surgery, and her secrecy uh, regarding her sex assigned at birth to justify their conclusion that she was harmed from being outed. And of course, you know, this is complicated because obviously, because of the ways in which privacy law generally doesn't respect contextual decisions, um, you know, this is not a problem exclusive to trans folks. But what it does mean in practice is that um, in the words of Jameson Green, um, the best, the most uh, successful transsexuals no longer are transsexuals at all. So to conclude, it's worth noting that transnormativity does not challenge the notion of transgender as state of exception or aberration. It merely medicalizes that notion. And in fact, transnormativity reinforces cisnormativity. And what that makes me question is whether privacy for trans folks is an appropriate tool for pursuing systemic change. The privacy cases that I've read fundamentally often rely on conservative notions of secrecy and control. In fact, judges tend to respond badly when folks are trying to articulate a more complex or nuanced relationship to parts of their gender um, that they may want to share and parts that they don't. Um, and that I frankly think that in this context, the radical potential of privacy arguments is profoundly limited, not just because of the ways in which uh, they often rely on this idea of the disappearing transsexual from uh, Jameson Green's work, but because lawyers are in the individual litigation cases are generally pursuing arguments that are best for their clients, which means that they often will make transnormative arguments because they know that's gonna be most successful, even if those don't challenge the underlying assumptions in the field or provide for folks who are more marginalized or whose genders might be less likely to be recognized in a meaningfully by a medical system. So that's the double bind of transgender privacy. Thank you for allowing me um, to present it. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciated that. And I'm excited to, to learn more in the Q&A. Um, let's move on to uh, Cynthia Conti-Cook. You ready to go? Oh, we can't hear you. Are, you, are your headphones connected? Okay. No, we still can't hear you. Do you want us to uh, to skip you for the moment and come back, circle back? We'll go ahead and skip for the moment. All right. Yeah, no problem. This is the world we're all living in right now. <laughs> Technology is great till it's not. Um, all right. So, uh, Lynn, if you don't mind, uh, let's go ahead and go to you. Are you ready? I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Can We can hear you fine. Just one second. So... I've been working and writing in the area of student privacy for quite a long time. And more recently, I've um, been researching and writing in the specific area of student medical privacy. Um, 
And what I'd like to chat about briefly today is uh, some student medical privacy issues with a particular focus on females who are patients at campus health clinics. And to start with, I wanna talk about the law that governs student medical information. Um, I think, you know, we've all been patients and we're used to our medical information um, having some meaningful privacy protection from the HIPAA privacy rule that was um, an administrative regulation enacted um, early in this century. And the privacy rule that, again, I think we all have some familiarity with um, gives us a right to access our own records. And that includes the right for patients who are minors who are able to consent to healthcare themselves. For example, in some states, minors can consent to outpatient reproductive care or substance abuse care or mental health care. And uh, HIPAA privacy rule gives those minor patients the right to access their own records and also to control their, whether their parents um, access those records. Um, and the privacy rule that again covers medical records generally also provides pretty broad confidentiality. Um, in particular for therapy notes, which I think we all understand are particularly sensitive and intimate. What um, is not as well known and may come as a surprise to some folks in the audience is that we're talking about student medical records. And by that, I mean medical records of students that a school creates or maintains, for example, in a campus health clinic. Those are excluded by the HIPAA privacy rule and they are left um, for privacy protection to another federal statute called FERPA. Um, and folks in the audience who are students or academics um, have some familiarity with FERPA. It's the general student education record statute that provides some privacy for our transcripts and um, other education records. Well, the way the laws are set up, um, student medical records are covered by FERPA and treated like other education records. Um, even though uh, student medical records are quite a bit more intimate and sensitive than some other education records like attendance records and matters like that. Um, and FERPA's protection of student privacy generally and um, of student medical privacy um, specifically has been uh, labeled by another commentator aptly so as cheesecloth protection. There's a whole lot of holes in it. Um, in terms of access, um, FERPA does not give students a broad right as patients to access their own medical records. Um, in some respects, it gives parents more access rights to student patient records than it does to the student patients themselves. Um, at the K-12 minor student level, the parents have a right of access to patient records. The student patients themselves do not. And in higher education, student patients do not have a broad general right of access to their own treatment records um, because FERPA excludes them from uh, student access. Um, but parents may see them if a school chooses to share because for example, the student is a financial dependent. So pretty different um, privacy protections for student medical information than for medical information generally. I wanna um, add to that legal information, some more public health and social science information about campus health clinics. Um, I think, again, the um, students and academics in the audience are well aware that they are pretty much ubiquitous um, on college campuses. Um, I was a college student in the 1970s 
um, and received my medical care from a campus health clinic. They also are expanding quickly at K-12 schools, um, disproportionately serving um, low-income students and students of color. Um, at campus health clinics, both um, higher ed and K-12, the vast majority of patients are female. Um, some studies estimate two thirds of health clinic patients at schools are females. And added to that, females disproportionately get care that is unusually sensitive. Um, disproportionately females get mental health care at campus health clinics and uh, disproportionately females get gynecological care, sexual health care, reproductive health care from, from campus clinics. And unfortunately, females also disproportionately get care as sexual misconduct victims, um, part of the national ep epidemic of campus sexual assault, um, which is now governed by Title IX and some new rules that I will mention um, in a few minutes. So um, add the lack of legal protection for student medical records with the realities of campus healthcare and the specific reality of campus healthcare for females. Um, and we have some problems. And I wanna mention two examples and then um, talk about some possible next steps. So the first example I wanna mention is the Jane Doe case um, that I've written quite a bit about. Um, Jane Doe as a college freshman was sexually assaulted by three of the, her college's basketball players. Um, one of the three had transferred into Jane Doe's college after being suspended for sexual assaulting a student at his prior college. Um, after her assault, um, Jane Doe got on-campus counseling, which put her college in the role as Jane Doe's healthcare provider. And she also sued her college under Title IX for essentially facilitating her sexual assault by allowing this one player to transfer in despite his history. And in her lawsuit, her college was not the healthcare provider, the college was Jane Doe's litigation defendant. Um, her college wanted to access Jane Doe's therapy records to defend her Title IX lawsuit. So think about the conflation and roles there. Colleges um, acquired this information and records as a healthcare provider, but they wanna conflate their role as an education claim, education litigation defendant to access healthcare records that they created as a healthcare provider. And because FERPA and not the HIPAA privacy rule governs these records, they were able to do that. And the university's attorney um, went over to the uh, campus counseling center and literally seized her healthcare records, including her actual therapy notes. Um, if Jane Doe had gotten private off-campus counseling, which would probably cost her more, would be less convenient under her college's healthcare plan, would have involved a different co and, and greater copay, the college would have had to subpoena the records um, for her college's attorney to access them and use them in her education law litigation. But because um, FERPA and not the HIPAA privacy rule governs these records, um, the attorney had, uh, unfortunately, from my perspective, a pretty strong argument that he had a legitimate educational interest in accessing her records. Um, FERPA also has a litigation exception that whenever a school and a student are in litigation, um, the school can access the records for litigation purposes. If Jane Doe had decided to transfer to a new school um, or attend graduate school at a different college, FERPA would allow her, her current college to send her entire student medical file along to the new college. If Jane Doe were her parents' financial dependent, which seems likely as a college freshman, 
the school would be allowed without Jane Doe's consent, even though her therapy involved some family issues to share her records with her parents. Um, and to add insult to injury, um, FERPA would not allow Jane Doe a broad direct right to access these records that the school was accessing. And the same college had access the records of another campus sexual assault victim before she had even seen her own records. So um, I think the Jane Doe case illustrates one of the problems with our current um, situation. Another problem, and I see I'm running out of time, is the new Title IX rules, which um, President Biden has ordered review of and the Department of Ed has announced they will review. That requires the same notice and comment process as enacting them did in the first place. So it will be several years um, before they are changed or repealed, if, if at all. Um, but the new rules do provide certain um, narrow privacy protections, including a rape shield for the complainant sexual history. And they don't allow schools to access a party's treatment records for the Title IX formal complaint process. But um, they give parents a lot of right of access to Title IX sexual assault formal complaint information. And they require that the school collect all of this information and share all of it with both parties and their advisors with no automatic ban on redisclosure of this information by the parties or their advisors. So um, it does say in the preamble that having the parties and their advisors sign a non-disclosure agreement is possible, but it is not required. So the new Title IX rules are, in, are on the books. They may change in a few years. There are some specific new narrow privacy protections, um, but in a broader context, um, not much privacy protection. So some next steps to consider are, from my perspective, to advocate for change in FERPA, the HIPAA privacy rule, the new Title IX rules, um, to identify or advocate for state laws that better protect student medical privacy, to advocate or identify um, better school policies like the ones um, some students, some law students yesterday described, um, success at achieving at their law school for um, menstrual hygiene products, um, and at the very least to make informed decisions as students, as advocates, as activists about um, getting healthcare on and off campus and participating in the new Title IX formal complaint process. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. And so much of this is just so shocking and I, I can't wait to, um, to talk more about it in the uh, Q and A. Um, so I just want to, um, and if you are ready to stop screen share, Lynn. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I uh, just wanted to check on Cynthia because I know she was getting in and out. Um, of the Zoom to see if she could solve the, oh, there you are. How are you doing? Does it work now? Yes, okay. success. Through the headphones. <laughs> All right, yeah, Hi, sometimes everybody. that's the way. Thank I'm you so off. much. No worries, I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you everybody. Thank you, Margaret and Michelle for inviting me. And thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. And to all the Law Review students, it's so wonderful to see your Working so closely with you for so much time. Um, I'm happy to be here today. I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I want to start with the story of a Black woman from Mississippi who went to the hospital in an ambulance with her stillborn fetus in 2017. At the hospital, medical staff called police on her. She was investigated for causing the death of her stillborn. And during that investigation, she was asked to hand over her phone. And she did. Prosecution brought second degree murder charges against her. And during the presentation of evidence against her to the grand jury, the DA introduced her statements to nurses, her medical records, 
and introduced a medical expert. Following this indictment, the defense did a fantastic job advocating uh, and undercutting the medical expert and basically left nothing for the DA to hang their hat on, except the DA still had evidence from her digital device, from her phone, that included her search history on Google and websites she visited about halfway through her pregnancy about obtaining abortion pills online and learning about what they did. That information was presented to the first grand jury and it was presented in the media as well as evidence that at least at one point during her pregnancy, this woman had considered having an abortion. My research into the intersection of criminalization of pregnant people and how technology is being used in the criminal justice system leads me to believe that these prosecutions of pregnant people will increasingly rely on digital evidence, as will all prosecutions. But when a jurisdiction has criminalized abortion, self-managed abortions, and people who assist people in getting abortions, as have many jurisdictions in the last five years, the lack of legal protection for information extracted from our digital devices will make a lot of information fair game for prosecutors and police to access, possibly without the target of an investigation even knowing. And I've realized, believe me, this sounds a little tinfoil hat-ish of me, but consider data brokers like Thomson Reuters. They sell a database to law enforcement. The information in that database, and this is you know, from their advertising materials comes from credit agencies, DMV records, cell phone registries, social media posts, property records, utility accounts, licenses, internet chat rooms, court records, bankruptcy filings. They say in their advertising materials that all of this information is fused and vetted by an algorithm to form an ever evolving 360 degree view of US residents' lives. And they produce a searchable database with all of that information and law enforcement can literally filter that information across various risk informed scores, including abortional act on self. So I realize that what I'm saying feels really futuristic and scary, but I want to emphasize that for some people, this is happening now. My conclusion that these types of tools will increase criminalization is based on a confluence of a lot of things happening at the same time, increasingly restricted access to abortion clinics, increasingly easy access to abortion pills online, increased criminalization of abortion, self-managed abortion, and people who assess pregnant people in getting abortions, the ability to track people in their digital devices, and a general increase in the number of government agencies who have access to and use indiscriminately powerful forensic and surveillance tools that digest digital devices into evidence, tools like the Thomson Reuters database and others like it. So I'll go through each of these top lines in a bit more detail. I'm sure that I don't have to tell anyone who's attending this conference that there has been an increase of criminalization of abortion, self-managed abortion, and people who assist people in getting abortions across the country. The current constellation of conservative judges on the Supreme Court has led at least 22 states as of 2019 to pass abortion bans, many of which criminalize not just the pregnant person, but also providers and people who assist them. And that's alongside an increase in newer fetal personhood laws, increased restrictions on how clinics operate, how wide their hallways have to be, whether there has to be a wait time between the first consultation and the procedure. And the new, new fetal personhood laws have also increased the types of ways that pregnant people are criminalized for their conduct during pregnancy. National advocates for pregnant women have done surveys of all the types of conduct that pregnant people have been criminalized for. And it ranges from things like smoking a cigarette to drinking alcohol or caffeine. At the same time, the restricted access to abortion clinics has driven more pregnant people to consider online alternatives like ordering abortion pills. And of course it makes sense that all of those restrictions, not to mention COVID, has driven pregnant people online like it's driven everybody online. Pregnant people increasing re increasingly rely on online resources to learn about and seek remedies for what used to be called obstruction of menstruation. Most Americans search for health topics online. Pregnant people seeking abortions online makes sense. 
There's no long distance traveling with all the logistics that requires. There's no coordinating staying nearby the clinic in states that require a wait time between consultation and procedure. You don't have to ask friends to watch your kids or watch your parents or borrow a car or find a place to stay overnight. You can do it online and handle it in a way that feels private. You don't even have to tell anyone. You just order, the pills are shipped, you follow the instructions, you're done. They're portable, easy to administer and safe. From 2015 to 2020, consistent searches for abortion pills were made in 29 states, most frequently in Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, and Texas, all states with new restrictions on abortion access at clinics. But the question remains, and I do wanna break this down for you, what are the ways that this online information is being traced by whom and under what circumstances. So first, I just wanna start off by saying that pregnant people's digital profiles are more refined than the average digital consumer. And that's because advertisers believe they buy more stuff, that new parents are vulnerable to building brand loyalty as they start their family. And advertisers have invested in developing their digital tools to be able to target that particular profile of a pregnant person with eerie accuracy, resulting in, for example, a father who marched into Target really upset about a coupon catalog addressed to his teenage daughter that was advertising her baby stuff, like diapers and clothes and all this stuff. And the father confronted the manager and said, why are you doing this? And the manager had no idea. But what Target was doing, it was assessing her buying history and using that buying history, which matched the buying history of other people that have been identified as pregnant in their digital profiles, and basically making an educated guess that this teenage daughter was pregnant. And guess what? She was. And the father, you know, the father said she didn't know either, but who knows? The father didn't know, had to apologize to the target manager. Professor Janet Vertezzi, a Princeton sociology professor, as an experiment, attempted to hide her pregnancy from the internet after hearing this story, just to prove how alert the internet is to identifying pregnant people. She and her husband used gift cards, cash, and strictly enforced a no pregnancy mention rule amongst their friends and family. This was not only social media, no emails, no text messages. This effort was like highly unrealistic, and it also made them a target. Her husband's strange accumulation of gift cards flagged him as a potential fraudster at a Rite Aid. If he was a different demographic, these efforts might have actually flagged law enforcement's attention. Think about it. Let's talk about how likely these digital searches are. And look, for many white people, we can mindlessly consult our pocket internet access device or thing that we still call phone or external cortex, however you, you know, describe your smartphone. We can ask it sort of any old thing, like, can I eat edibles while pregnant? And not really consider the possibility that someone might be looking over my shoulder. But digital searches of black, indigenous, and other non-white communities are commonly co-occurring with other illegal searches and surveillance. Police are commonly grabbing smartphones and other devices out of people's pockets and demanding access in the midst of you know, an unlawful street stop or an unlawful vehicle stop or a home search. The most common way that digital information is actually accessed is through mobile device forensic tools. Upturn, a tech policy think tank, issued a report last year called Mass Extraction. Even though many digital access versus law enforcement conversations and media that you might have heard are about like encryption and whether Apple should make a backdoor for law enforcement, the truth is law enforcement doesn't really need a backdoor. They get access pretty easily. During an investigation or prosecution, they are routinely getting access to people's digital devices, either because like the black woman from Mississippi, they just gave it with consent, um, even if they gave it with limited consent, sometimes courts issue warrants. And what do they have access to when they plug your phone into a digital mobile device forensic tool? They can do a keyword search, image search, social network analysis. They can generate a geographic map based on your location. Uh, text messages, calendar invites, Google searches, all of this information, plus app data. And for pregnant people, one of the types of data, of app data that could be most harmful is their menstruation apps or their fertility apps. I mean, fertility apps ask you to register your mood and like your sex history on a daily basis. And that information is not private. That information often gets sold to data brokers and can be accessible by law enforcement. So according to mass extraction by upturn, thousands of agencies across the US have these digital forensic tools, 
public housing authorities, prisons, public schools, and all types of police departments. Upturn also found that police departments don't limit what types of cases they use these tools on. They use them for everything from violent felonies to petty larceny and everything in between. There's no reason to think that they would, for some reason, carve out abortion uh, related crimes if they've been criminalized in the state. And certainly if you look at this woman from Mississippi, she was charged with second degree murder. That would certainly qualify um, even if there were restrictions on what types of crimes they could use this information on. And that's important because there is a significant gap in legal protections for digital data. First, the police and prosecutors have access to digital forensic tools, but most public defenders do not. The New York Times did an article last year about this asymmetry and its consequences. It's important because the legal status of digital device searches needs defense attorneys to be making more arguments against intrusive searches and seizures. There was one case, Riley versus California in 2014, where there's the first time that the Supreme Court even acknowledged the importance of modern cell phones. And then later in Carpenter in 2018, another Supreme Court case, the court finally held that the third party doctrine, which meant that if you share this information on your phone with your phone company or your internet service provider, you don't really have like an expectation of privacy. But the court said like, we are so involuntarily reliant on these devices that we do need some protection, but that only applied to location data. District courts following Carpenter have limited its application saying that that only applies to the government when it's seeking location data from your phone company and not, for example, your Google search history. And now, for those of us who have been sitting at our computers like this and basically using the computer as our portal to the outside world, we know that the richness of our Google search history might be more rich than our location data this year when it comes to being able to look at something to explain our mentality on numerous subjects, right? Nonetheless, there's no protections from Carpenter for anything but location data. So the search browsing history, unencrypted communications, purchasing history, all of that coming from not only our phones, but wearable devices, smart home devices, your Alexa or your Echo that's on your kitchen table, plus all the types of apps that are individually collecting data as well. All of these items store information that's relevant to pregnant people's reproductive health decision-making processes. And while location data has some protections, in regards to how law enforcement can use it and access it, it doesn't stop government agencies actually from just buying it from data brokers like Thomson Reuters to go back to them. There was just a bill introduced yesterday in Congress, the Fourth Amendment is not for sale to prevent that kind of exchange. And law enforcement, I also wanna say, is not the only ones with the tech toys. Anti-abortion advocates, for example, have also been able to take out micro-targeted ad campaigns using tools sim similar to Thomson Reuters' risk flag algorithm, so that every time a person profiled as, you know, like abortion maybe, walks into a geofenced location, for example, Planned Parenthood, they receive commercials on their browser about, you know, maybe in misinformation about abortions or pills or redirecting her to a fake crisis center or straight up judging her for being there, like a virtual pickup pick, picket line. And the AG in Massachusetts sued the company doing this, but that only stopped them from doing it in Massachusetts. The final thing that I want to remind everyone is that miscarriages naturally terminate 21% of pregnancies after week five and as many as 75% of pregnancies before week five. It's not uncommon for a woman who has contemplated, maybe even searched for information about abortion, to just have a miscarriage. But these digital tools increase the ability for police and prosecutors pursuing anti-abortion agendas to surveil and identify people searching for information about abortion without needing to rely on medical staff at hospitals to refer people for prosecution, which expands the net of people they can criminalize. Some remedies to this problem, obviously decriminalizing abortion everywhere on the state levels, expanding telemed options and removing some of the FDA restrictions on access to abortion pills, bans on consent searches for devices that happened in Michigan last year, bans on plain view searches, state privacy protections, increased access to forensic tools for defenders, protections against corporate surveillance data being for sale to government agencies, et cetera, and understanding and socializing more dig digital protection measures using anti-fingerprinting browsers, VPNs, encrypted apps for communication, and aligning with others in social justice spaces, policing and immigration, for example, to fight against how increased access and money for surveillance tools by police is harming us all. Thank you, guys. 
All right, thank you so much. And I was actually kind of surprised uh, when you said the word A-L-E-X-A -E that nobody's uh, went off. I was expecting to see something in the chat that you had set somebody's off. Um, but, you know, and I, I have to kind of uh, shout out this panel because I think this is an unprecedented thing in that um, I didn't have to tell anyone <laughs> to stop. Um, so uh, that's incredible. Thank you for keeping your time so well so that we have a lot of time for fantastic questions. So, and thank you for everyone who has already put some questions in the chat. Um, I know it's gonna be a really robust conversation. Um, if, yes, Kendra, ending on time is a feminist act. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, keep them coming and we'll go ahead and get started with the conversation. But on one theme that I really saw um, that probably won't surprise you too much, um, but throughout all the presentations is not just this concept of controlling female bodies, but trapping people. Um, you know, Kendra, you know, from, our, from yours, I really got the feeling that, you know, trans people are, you know, trapped by the law into making arguments, um, inauthentic arguments that, you know, oh, well, in order to get the relief that I'm seeking, I have to basically go on record as saying, I hate my body. I was born in the wrong body, um, even if that's not true. Um, and then um, when, you know, student patients really being trapped by a system that forces um, uh, institutions, you know, that directs institutions to create records that then are, you know, are already known that they're not going to be private later on. Um, and then that even following um, female bodied people when they transfer, you know, if they just decide that the trauma is too great at the school they were at, then they transfer and the records follow. Um, and then Cynthia, you know, the, what, the Mississippi anecdote that you raised um, really uh, uh, raised some flags for me about, you know, the arguments that we're hearing nowadays about um, folks that should have complied with police. When she does comply, she's absolutely, um, you know, she, she's creating evidence that's being used against her to um, bring up murder charges. And so, um, you know, I wonder if um, any of, if that's resonating with y'all and if you have um, anything to add to that or, or any responses to that to kind of kick, us, kick off our conversation. And that's for all of you. I know I said a lot of things. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll go. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think that's totally, I think it's totally right. I also think that like, one tension I think is, you know, that I'm hearing that across many of, of the presentations is sort of the role, like the difficulties that individual litigants may be facing in these like broader systemic spaces where the uh, privacy may benefit them in some cases, but not in others. And like how that corresponds to like broader power dynamics, but like, you know, it's sort of getting acted upon on like the individual like level with your story, Lynn, about Jane Doe, and then uh, Cynthia with the story about the sort of Mississippi, um, uh, the uh, miscarriage case. Uh, and I, I think it's really, I think it's really striking because I think sometimes I know, especially in the sort of uh, some parts of the privacy law space, privacy law is often considered very highly abstract, right? It's like, a, you know, something that's happening up here with companies and the GDPR and CCPA and like that kind of thing. And I think I'm really you know, grateful. I think it's the way that I think all of us are really focused on a very particular, like, okay, like what does this mean for individual folks, right? Rather than thinking about it as like a sort of a, a much more abstracted notion. Yeah, I'll just, I agree 100%. And I, like Nicole, you brought up the word inauthentic. And I think that that resonates for me as a theme in our work as well. One um, terrible consequence of this is that like, okay, so let's say you're a pregnant person who knows all the digital dangers, but still doesn't want to be pregnant. And um, having to make decisions about you know ways to protect yourself online as you go about trying to get the information that you have. Let's say even the the most you know sort of like um, 
a careful and cautious user of technology does everything right, it's still very difficult to protect 100%. And that person having to weigh that against making this health decision, I think, is just um, so detrimental, not only to that person, but to all of us, right? Those types of tensions should not be what we're navigating when we're trying to just achieve healthcare, basically. And Nicole, the theme of being trapped really resonates for me with students. Um, FERPA is not exactly robust privacy protection for students in the first place, but it really falls apart with regard to student medical records. And it has a grossly disproportionate impact on, on females. Um, and I think in the case of sexual assault victims, there's uh, it exacerbates the trauma of being a victim and you know, not even having privacy in basic records surrounding the assault. Absolutely. You know, so this is, uh, you know, these, these kinds of uh, issues that all of you have raised are just, are so um, chilling, but let, you know, let's, let's talk about, let's talk policy a little bit. Um, to see if, if we can bring back some optimism and, and you know, uh, lay down some groundwork to make this stuff better. Um, so uh, Kendra, I'll start with you. Um, what recommendation would you have for um, a policy to stop teacher gatekeeping of uh, restroom access for students? Um, uh, particularly when this policy is partially driven by um, providing a choice of privacy uh, to tran trans individuals who menstruate. Um, I mean, I think that generally speaking, you know, uh, my answer would be that the state just like, and in this case, I'm including teachers in the state, although that's not necessarily always the choice I would make, right, needs to get out of the, the business of regulating uh, who goes to the bathroom where. Um, like, I don't, I just don't think that like, that's a productive or useful or like ethical or okay like I think that there is precious little evidence that that's ever been anything that kept anybody safe or helped folks, right? And so I think for me, um, the uh, the I think that even sort of being like permissive about it, being like, okay, like you're uh, you know a trans man, and you can you know you can use the men's restroom, right? Like. It, it still exceptionalizes trans folks, right? Like if a trans man or a young like a uh, trans boy is a trans boy, then he, he should use the restroom that every other boy does. And it shouldn't take like a, a, a policy, right? It's just like use the restroom, right? Like I also think that generally my view on this is that like the move towards more gender neutral options has been really net positive. And that I think that that's uh, part of it is moving towards a place where folks don't feel like they are, it is appropriate to police folks' interventions into um, uh, restrooms based on their presentation. You know, just to sort of jump to the question more broadly about policy and briefly, so because I know there's going to be questions for other folks as well. I think for me, one of the really effective policy, what, one of the things I found in this research is that um, high level policy interventions around state uh, collecting and uh, monitoring of gender information or um, blanket rules about, for example, sealing um, trans name changes have been much more effective at protecting privacy than individual choices by litigants because they, um, they often result in uh, not needing to have litigants make individual arguments about themselves, but sort of be able to speak more broadly to, hey, like, you know, I don't, um, th this just shouldn't be on a record somewhere. Um, and like I, that as a default, I think has been really promising um, because it doesn't rely on folks' individual interventions. So I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I think that's great. And that gives so much food for thought and um, ideas about how to frame um, you know, action going forward. Uh, so Lynn, I'll turn to you. Um, what would your ideal Title IX rule look like? Um, 
well, my ideal Thailand role would take me the rest of the day to explain. <laughs> um, but uh, at, a, at a bare minimum in terms of privacy, um, I understand why uh, the parties need to access the evidence that the school actually use in a hearing or meeting to make a determination. But, two buts on that one, but one, there's no reason to share, you know, the complainant's sexual history or se sexual reputation, which is protected by the rape shield and admissible with the other party. And but number two, there's no good reason um, with regard to what is shared to not forbid redisclosure of that information. Um, the other part of my ideal Title IX rule would um, be to re-examine something I didn't talk about, which is the um, current approach is that if a party or a witness does not submit to full cross-examination, which means answer every question on cross, then all of their statements are excluded. So if a respondent confesses, but then doesn't appear at the hearing or doesn't answer some questions on cross, um, all of their statements made outside of the hearing or in the hearing are excluded from the hearing process. And there's frankly no way um, to prove a case um, with that approach to evidence. And I have another article coming out on yet another thing I'm unhappy about with the Title IX rule, which is the evidentiary approach, which is not so much a privacy issue. Well, I can't wait to read that because I, I think there's just going to be so much Great stuff in that, and that's that's so shocking. The um, cross examination rule. Um, ooh, all right. Well, um, Cynthia, let's go ahead and turn to you. Um, so, one, you know, how much is the the pro choice movement focused on these issues, um, and what kinds of um, policy uh, are you advocating and and seeing others advocate for, and what are you looking at next? I think that the the types of policies that would address this problem, I mean, first, we just have to start with decriminalizing abortion, obviously, um, and not making things that are about privacy, health related decision making processes, even available for criminalization. Um, and that applies to, you know, sort of not just decisions about abortion, but for example, um, transgender people that are trying to access hormones in states that have criminalized access to hormones for certain ages, it, they, they also are going to have this problem where people trying to access cannabis or psilocybin or other types of alternative health remedies are having this same issue. It doesn't, it's not an, a problem that's particularly isolated to abortion and people seeking abortion pills online, for example. The other types of um, ways that we can address this. I mean, I hope that everyone who leaves here today, if their friend asks them like, what's wrong with corporate surveillance? I like targeted advertising that someone, you can say something back like, well, you know, people sitting in Planned Parenthood clinics, for example, are being targeted with terrible messaging. And that's not just happening to them. There's profiles on these databases that are able to uh, micro-target people with a sexual assault history, for example, as well. And so there's so many ways that the um, infrastructure of corporate surveillance into all of the data that they're churning out from us and how it's being collected and used needs to be regulated. And I think that that's a, a huge area. Um, it's a huge area that I'm, I'm looking at from many different angles, not just the, the impact that it has um, on reproductive justice. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see the, you know, the arc of where that goes, because there's definitely so much to say. Um, and speaking of which, um, there's so much to say on all of these topics, um, but obviously we have limited time. So we're going to um, move forward and hopefully we'll be able to learn more about um, all of this, um, these matters in the breakout rooms. Um, and it's been such a delight to work with all of you all. So I can't wait to hear more, hopefully, in the breakouts. Um, Michelle, I'll go ahead and kick it over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Kendra, Lynn, and Cynthia, for those incredibly informative, uh, thought-provoking presentations. And we do have a chance now to talk further as a community. So our next panel um, 
is on resisting intrusions into physical privacy. And that starts at 1045. But before then, during our break time for the next half hour or so, we have two break rooms that are going to be open and we invite you to join them. Um, the first room is for people who want to talk more about the issues of this panel, data privacy and social justice. And then we have another room, room two, which we are calling Act academic and activist social mingle, which is just a chance to meet folks attending the conference. Normally at this point, we'd all be like moving into the hall of the coffee urn <laughs> and chit chatting around, you know, with a cup of coffee. And so this is our attempt to replicate that. And I want to let the students know that you should come as well. We have student ambassadors in every room. So there will be a mix of professors and community members and students in every room. We've made sure that that would happen. So no one should feel um, that it's not a welcome space for them. Uh, obviously, this is totally optional and we understand also if you want to go you know grab a drink or use the restroom you can go come back the breakout rooms will be here so uh this is an innovation that we are trying for this conference and we hope you'll you'll give it a give it a shot with us so our wonderful um tech expert jared is going to um put the breakout rooms on the screen. And this is a new feature Zoom has now where we don't assign you to rooms, you can pick your own room. So this is also um, a bit of a tech experiment. So that should be happening. I don't know, Jared, can you um, let you us know how the breakout the rooms are? Can you say that again? You should see them at the bottom. Yep, it's there, uh, Michelle. Do you, so do you have to you click on breakout rooms? What, yeah, explain exactly. what they need to do. Okay, so, uh, so click. You have to, go ahead. I'm sorry. I see it now. If you click on the breakout rooms and your control bar, you will see that there are choices, and you can pop into the rooms as you see fit, and they are populating, which is awesome. And we hope to see you there, and definitely back at 10:45 for the next panel. And just to clarify, breakout room one is data privacy as social justice breakout room two is academic and activist social mingle. How do we get into the room? So if you look at the bottom, you should see breakout rooms. If you click on it, it should give you an option just to like, click on the room i see who's in the rooms oh you know what because you're a co you're a co-host let me see if i can move you yeah i want to go to room one so that's go to room one okay I'm, yeah. as soon as i move you you're gonna go same thank you jared, me, jared. <laughs> i'm sorry can you repeat that this is cynthia i'm i'm having the same issue i can yeah only... it's because it's because you're a co-host what room did you want to go to one as well thank you yep I wasn't sure which Michelle you were referring to. Oh, I didn't see. Oh, there's well, because I can't see everyone. All Michelle's. Hello, Michelle. You are nice to see you from Michelle Gelman. <laughs> we'll start in a minute as everyone comes back from the breakout rooms. Welcome back to the conference. I hope those of you who are in the breakout rooms had a good conversation. I know we did in the breakout room I was in. Um, there were some incredible insights and discussion. And so now we're gonna move into our next panel on resisting intrusions into physical privacy. Our wonderful moderator is Shanta Trivedi, who is currently teaching at Georgetown University Law Center in their domestic violence clinic. So Shanta, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It is really nice to be here. I am, like many of you, devastated that we're not in person, um, but it's still nice to see your faces in these little squares. Um, 
I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time introducing our presenters. I just put the link to their bios um, in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to introduce them really briefly. First up, we're going to have Michelle Yort, an associate professor at the Washburn University School of Law, where she directs the Washburn Law Clinic. And she is a former teaching fellow here at UB. Um, so we're happy to have her back. We used to have offices next to each other um, as we were just reminiscing in the breakout room. Um, Next is Susan Hazeldean, an associate professor of law and founder of the, excuse me, founder and director of the Brooklyn Law School LGBT Advocacy Clinic. And finally, Jenny Brooke Condon, who is a professor of law in the Center for so Social Justice, where she directs the Equal Justice Clinic. So each panelist will present for 15 minutes, after which we'll open it up for your questions. So feel free to post your questions at any time in the chat um, or send them directly to me. I'll keep an eye on those. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Michelle. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm going to get my PowerPoint pulled up here. Um, I have so much appreciation for Michelle Gilman and Margaret Johnson and the mentoring that they provided. Um, just a quick question. I am not able to actually share my screen. It says the host is disabled screen sharing. Um, but I just want to say thank you to them for the help that they provided when I was a fellow and that they still continue to mentor me. Um, also to all the students who have um, organized this conference. Um, it's so wonderful to be able to present um, and to talk to people and to learn from people again after the really um, challenging last year and a quarter. And then um, lastly, I wanted to just thank my research assistants. At least one of them is on the call or on the um, Zoom today. So thank you to Shambria Dale, Emily Lauritsen, and Hannah Arneson for their work at various stages in the um, project. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about an issue that's really near and dear to my heart, and that is how to make subsidized housing more responsive to the needs of tenants. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the process that housing authorities require tenants to go through to either add someone to their household or to remove someone from official household records and the impact that has on tenants' fundamental rights to privacy and family autonomy. So talk about some problems and then um, discuss some um, solutions. But before we dive into the discussion of the problem, I want to provide a little bit of context for why subsidized housing policy in general and the process of household change requests in particular is a gender justice and racial justice issue. Um, because I realize people might not have a lot of familiarity with some of these programs. So public housing um, began in the 1930s as part of a New Deal program to provide safe, affordable housing to people who couldn't afford or find housing on the private market. So what you're looking at here is a photo of Altgeld Gardens in Chicago. This is a public housing development that was built in 1944. It's still in operation today. And this was actually the first public housing development in which I worked. Um, so in public housing, local public housing authorities administer federal funds and use that money to operate these developments that the housing authorities own and administer. And so tenants pay a share of their income as rent to the housing authority directly. Um, and so that is sort of the oldest subsidized housing program in the country. Well, over the course of the 20th century, subsidized housing evolved to, and um, the voucher program came into being. Many people would know the voucher program as Section 8. Um, what we're talking about here with the tenant-based voucher program is literally a piece of paper. You're looking at the actual voucher that tenants get to go out and find um, housing on the private rental market. And so the tenants pay a percentage of their income to the private landlord is rent. And then the housing authority, which administers the voucher program, um, pays the rest of the rent to the landlord. Um, subsidized housing, whether you're talking about you know, public housing or Section 8 or another uh, form of subsidized housing, is a really critical part of the social safety net. Um, some folks might be familiar with Matthew Desmond's work in his book Evicted, um, where he documents the struggles of low-income renters. Um, and in that um, book, he talks about the Milwaukee Rent Court Study where he and the other researchers found that for people going through rent court um, in, in the city of Milwaukee, 80, um, I'm sorry, one third of them were paying 80% of their monthly income for rent. 
80% of the household income going to rent. And of the um, tenants in um, rent court in Milwaukee, a majority were, were spending at least half of their income on rent. And so, and as we're seeing the pandemic, so many uh, families are just one uh, paycheck away from homelessness. And so subsidized housing is a really essential resource for folks who are having trouble um, paying market rate rent. And there are a lot of people who do utilize subsidized housing. So what you're looking at here are statistics from the 2020 to 2021 reporting um, period. Over one and a half million people live in public housing. Um, over four million people live in households that are assisted by Section 8 vouchers. Um, so this is an important resource. There are a lot of people who would like to live in subsidized housing to utilize these subsidies, but who can't because the waiting lists are so long. Uh, many waiting lists are years long. And in fact, many housing authorities are not even accepting new applications. Um, because there's so many people on the waiting list. And so demand for subsidized housing really um, far exceeds supply. Um, because subsidized housing is reserved for people of low income, it unfortunately um, reflects the US's history of um, race and gender-based discrimination, which has um, caused tremendous disparities in income. And um, what we know is that women in general and women of color in particular are overrepresented in certain subsidized housing programs. So what you're looking at here is um, data that shows the percentage of the population in the US as a whole that identifies as black, so about 13%, as opposed to the percentage of public housing residents who identify as black, that's about 43%, so more than three times the rate. And then on the right, you have a, a, a chart there that shows the percentage of households that are female headed with minor children. So in the US as a whole, that's 12.3% of the households, whereas in public housing specifically, that's 33% of the households. And if you look at female headed households generally in public housing, that's 74% of the households. Because public housing is disproportionately female, and um, residents are disproportionately women of color, public housing is subject to the same narrative about undeserving poor. And for those of you who are listening, but not, you know, can't see my box, I'm using air quotes here because I am not saying these folks are undeserving, but there is this narrative about undeserving poor. And there's this animus um, that perpetuates means tested benefits in general that is very um, um, prevalent in subsidized housing programs. And this narrative and this animus shapes public housing authority policy and procedure. And the particular policy that I'm looking at here involves the what public housing and Section 8 tenants have to go through to either add or remove um, a household member. Um, and there is a role that the housing authorities play in this process. Um, it makes sense that housing authorities know who needs to live in a unit. By law, um, regulations kept uh, cap a household's rent at 30% of household income. So what that means is to set rent correctly, housing authorities need to know who is in the unit and what their income is. That allows them to determine, you know, entire, you know, household income and then calculate that 30% of rent. Um, second, federal regulations um, include prohibitions for people with certain types of criminal records. And so housing authorities need to be able to run background checks on adult, adult applicants to the household to know if people actually qualify. So I don't dispute that housing authorities have a role to play in approving or denying um, household composition um, change requests. The problem is the way in which housing authorities go about considering requests to either add or remove household members. We see two problems. First, housing authorities often take months or longer to add uh, or to make a decision on the request to add or remove someone. There is no timeline in the public housing regulations saying these requests have to be responded to in you know, X number of months. And so housing authorities take months and months and months. And so people continue in limbo, not knowing if their household member you know, can be added or uh, if their household member can be added or if um, the former household member who has left um, can be removed from official records. The second problem we see is that housing authorities are required requiring third party evidence of a former household member's new address before they remove someone from official records. So asking that the house, the housing authority um, tenant provide a lease or utility bills or a statement like a certified statement from a landlord before they remove a, a former household member. 
Um, and to help you understand kind of who this is impacting, this is um, a tenant who has been going through this process with the housing authority of um, Annapolis, the city of Annapolis. Um, this is Ms. Gladden. She had um, lost her job. She was a school bus driver. And so when the summer um, came, she was no longer driving and so had a change of income, asked that the housing authority would um, adjust her household income, decrease her rent. She provided, you know, pay stubs, things like that, showing that she was, you know, no longer working. Um, mm -hmm. And the housing authority said, no, this is insufficient. We need more records. And they sued her five times in four months. And so this litigation dragged on and on and on. And the amount in dispute was $1,128. So after months and months of litigation, the courts finally said to the housing authority, listen, she has established this change. You need to adjust her records and you need to credit her the $1,128. She was successful because she was patient, was willing to keep going to court over and over again, and she had the good fortune of having a legal aid attorney represent her. There are many tenants who don't have that luxury of access to counsel. Um, and so what's the harm here? You know, if people are not able to add a house, a family member to their household, or if a former household member is still on the records, you know, how does this impact people? The failure to timely add a household member um, causes a number of problems. Um, it means that the tenant cannot legally have their new family member move in. So if they've gotten married, if they have a new partner, if they have an adult child who for whatever reason needs to move back into the family home, they can't do that legally. And if they allow the person to move in, they then are subject to the threat of eviction for failure to have an unauthorized, unauthorized occupant, which is a lease violation. And so either you can't have your wishes effectuated in what your family composition is, what your household looks like, or you're at risk of eviction. And um, the, the tenant would then be you know, deprived of companionship and support. Well, the Supreme Court has repeatedly found over the last 100 years that privacy um, and marriage and parenting are fundamental rights that are subject to due process protections. But what we're seeing here is in failing to grant these requests to add household members, the housing authorities are unnecessarily and improperly interfering with these uh, fundamental rights. The second problem comes when housing authorities fail to timely remove household members from official records. So what that means is that former household members income is still imputed to the household. So rent can be set improperly high. And if the tenant pays that improperly high rent, they then have, then have less money available to use to cover other necessary expenses. If they don't have the money to pay that improperly high rent, they then face the threat of eviction due to failure to pay rent. They might become homeless. And if that former household member is arrested for criminal activity, the tenant is subject to eviction um, due to um, a breach of lease violation for criminal activity. And as we know, um, given the over-policing that occurs in black and brown neighborhoods, family members of tenants of color are disproportionately likely to have contact with law enforcement, putting tenants at risk for eviction. So these are some problems that relate to the timing, the fact that housing authorities are not required to issue decisions on these requests in any particular amount of time. The requirement that tenants provide third-party proof of a former household member's new address, which leads to delays, requires them to engage with a former household member. And this is problematic for a couple of reasons. First of all, for house, former household members who are not stably housed, they would not actually have a lease to produce or utility records in their name. Uh, people who are couch surfing or moving from shelter to shelter or sleeping on streets can't provide proof of a new permanent residence because they don't have one. Those records don't exist. And lest you think that this is just sort of an academic you know, concern, um, there's a famous case out of Norwalk, Connecticut, um, uh, the case of Mary Harris, where her daughter moved out, um, could not produce you know, a new lease. She was um, involved in some um, substance abuse, was not doing well, and was bouncing around from place to place. Daughter got um, picked up on drug charges. That activity was imputed to Ms. Harris excuse me, and she was sent eviction um, papers. 
Now she again was able to obtain counsel, legal aid attorney, and so was able to keep her housing, but this happens. Um, the second problem is if the former household member was abusive towards the tenant, if this is a domestic violence situation, requiring the tenant to continue to interact with the former household member to get their records continues to subject them to the control of their abuser or their former abuser. Um, and so there are these whole range of problems um, that arise. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so there's the risk of homelessness, there's the risk of ongoing abuse, and then the fact that people's fundamental rights to privacy are trampled on. So there's the decisional aspect of privacy, where people can't effectuate their wishes as to what their you know, family unit is. And then there's the um, spatial or physical aspect of privacy, where people cannot use their home, their physical space to do what they want. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the pollen in Kansas is really intense right now, and so my allergies are kicking in. So you might be thinking, well, don't subsidize tenants have due process rights. You know, there should be protections in place for them, and there are. Subsidized tenants are entitled to written notice that explains the reason for a housing authority's adverse decision. Tenants can conduct discovery and review public housing authority records. No subpoena power for third party records, but they can review the housing authority records. They're entitled to a hearing at which they can present evidence and they're entitled to a written decision by the hearing officer. The problem is these due process rights are only available if the housing authority actually issues an adverse decision. What we're seeing is housing authorities are simply issuing no decision. They're delaying. They're not responding to the tenant request to add or remove household members. And so tenants just have to continue in limbo. And so I propose two solutions. The first is to treat a housing authority's delay and responding to a household composition change request as a constructive denial. Um, and there is precedent for this in administrative law for treating unreasonable delay as constructive of, of denials. The first area that you'll see on the left is fair housing law. So under the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act, housing providers have to make reasonable accommodations to their policies or procedures or allow reasonable modifications to physical units to allow folks with disabilities to utilize housing. And for decades, <coughs> excuse me, courts have found that failure to respond to these requests in a timely manner is, is a denial and then allows you know, the tenant to proceed with a case against the housing authority or other provider. And I would just draw your attention to the case of Broom Resources versus Parish of Jefferson. <coughs> this was a case out of um, a case from 2000 where a group home had applied for a variance, a zoning variance, to allow five unrelated individuals to live in the same unit and to receive services. And in that case, the um, parish waited three months and didn't respond to their request. The court found that three month delay in responding, the three months of just waiting to be a constructive denial. The second um, area of administrative law that is useful and that would, would support you know, this, um, this um, strategy um, is the administrative law practice of saying, you don't have to go through administrative exhaustion if the agency is the problem. So administrative exhaustion is the admin law principle that says before someone can pursue a case in court, they have to work their way through the administrative system, go through the agency's procedure for you know, challenging an, an agency action. Well, again, you have some cases here on the right that show that for almost 100 years, courts have said if the agency is the problem, if the agency is delaying, you don't have to go through the agency process, you can go to judicial review, because why should the agency um, be protected from judicial review if they're the ones who are not doing what they're supposed to do and not processing requests. And so this has come up in the context of telephone rate um, cases, um, uh, prison litigation um, relating to uh, medication changes uh, for prisoners, things like that. And so there's quite a robust body of case law um, that says if an agency or a housing provider delays in, a, in responding to a request, um, the person making the request or the ent entity making that request can treat that delay as a denial. And then they're subject to all of the judicial review rights. And so this could be adopted in the, in the subsidized housing um, context. It would be a way to use procedural due process to protect important substantive due process rights. 
And then just briefly, my second proposal is to um, create subpoena power like exists under the Administrative Procedure Act. So this requirement that there be third party verification of household change is related to this concept of verification extremism where agencies administering public benefits demand stricter documentation than the federal regulations governing those programs actually require. And this is based on the idea that, you know, means tested benefits um, programs are helping people who are fraudulent and who are trying to game the system. And we need to be really careful because they're going to try and cheat. Well, the reality is research shows that is not what is going on. Um, there is not a higher incidence of fraud in means tested benefits programs than in other um, public benefits programs. However, and so I would argue that tenants should just be able to self certify that there's been a household composition change. And unless there is specific evidence showing that that particular household is engaging in fraud, there should be no requirement for third party verification. But if housing authorities say this is necessary, we have to have this in every single case, then either the statute governing subsidized housing or the regulations governing subsidized housing must be amended to allow subpoena power. Um, and so I hope that this helps you understand the challenges that low income folks who are relying on these public uh, important public benefits are facing and that we have a role in advocacy, both in terms of how we frame arguments if we're representing tenants and how we ask public housing authorities and HUD to administer these programs. Um, so thank you so much um, for this time. I look forward to hearing from the other presenters and um, answering any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, that was kind of horrifying. Um, but you know, your solutions are so practical and don't seem that difficult. So um, I hope to get into more of that into in the uh, Q and A period. I'm going to turn it over now to Susan. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. I'm uh, so excited to be here, and I, I really want to thank. Um, uh, uh, well, I'd say thank you to everyone really for the opportunity to talk with you about uh, my research uh, today. I'm, I'm so excited to uh, speak to someone other than people in my immediate family for once. It's really nice. Um, so uh, I want to talk with you about um, the use of privacy as a pretext for discrimination, uh, particularly a pretext for discrimination against LGBT people. Um, so my project is about uh, an effort uh, mounted by opponents of LGBT equality across the country, uh, really, in court cases, in legislative debates, and in ballot measure campaigns, uh, where uh, opponents of LGBT rights have claimed that legal protections from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity is going to infringe on the privacy of women and girls. Um, and the argument was that unless anti-discrimination protections for LGBT people were rolled back, uh, women uh, were going to face privacy violations because transgender people would be able to use bathrooms that accord with their gender identity. So I think it's important to ask, uh, is there a legally cognizable privacy interest in excluding trans women from women's bathrooms and trans men from men's bathrooms? Um, and my thought was that we could try to answer that question by looking to legal privacy theory. Um, so uh, my paper uh, engages the work of scholars who have developed various philosophical understandings of privacy that are thought to justify a right to privacy protection. Um, so privacy has you know, many meanings to many different people, um, but it has been conceptualized variously as a right to be let alone, uh, a means to limit access to the self, a safeguard of intimacy, a right to control information, a defense for personhood, and a protection for social networks. Uh, but none of these conceptions of privacy support a right for cisgender objectors to exclude trans people from facilities that accord with their gender identity. And indeed, when we examine the issue through these privacy theories, we can see that it is transgender people Whose, uh, whose privacy is actually violated um, by these types of advocacy campaigns. Um, okay, so just to give a quick roadmap for uh, my talk, I wanna begin by describing how opponents of LGBT rights 
have used concerns about privacy to try to argue for rolling back protections for LGBT people. Uh, I want to discuss a case uh, where these arguments were used to argue for curtailing LGBT rights. Uh, then I want to discuss a couple of the most prominent conceptions of privacy advanced by legal scholars and why they do not support a privacy right for excluding uh, trans people from bathrooms that accord with their gender identity. And then I want to conclude with a few thoughts about what's at stake in this debate and why I think that the privacy arguments being asserted by conservatives actually harm all people, uh, particularly women, including cisgender women, because they validate misogynistic and racist stereotypes. Um, okay, so let's talk about the claim that anti-discrimination laws and policies that forbid gender identity discrimination uh, harm uh, women's privacy. Um, so this claim has been used to oppose anti-discrimination protection for LGBT people in a variety of contexts, uh, including legislative battles, uh, either to block and prevent the enactment of anti-discrimination protections, or to try and roll back or eliminate state or local civil rights laws that forbid discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, and also in ballot measures uh, to roll back anti-discrimination protection. And I would note that this strategy has actually been quite successful uh, for conservatives. It has uh, been successfully used to prevent anti-discrimination laws from being enacted, uh, to, to get them repealed in many communities uh, all around the United States. Um, and similar privacy claims are also, or have also been raised in court to argue that the rights of LGBT people should be restricted. So let me just give you one example of that. Um, in Doe versus Boyertown Area School District, four students sued their school district uh, because their school allowed trans students to use bathrooms and locker rooms that accord with their gender identity on a case-by-case -case basis. So the plaintiffs were cisgender people, that is to say their gender identities aligned with the sex they were assigned at birth. Uh, one plaintiff, Alexis Lightfoot, wrote an op-ed for USA Today in which she said that she had filed suit because, quote, my privacy shouldn't depend on what others believe about their gender. Um, so Lightfoot and the other plaintiffs were alleging that their school's policy violated their constitutional right to privacy under the 14th Amendment, among other claims. And they sought a preliminary injunction requiring the school district to force all students to use facilities corresponding to the sex they were assigned at birth, as opposed to respecting the gender identity of trans students and use, allowing them to use facilities that accorded with their gender identity. The plaintiffs lost in the district court and the third circuit, and they then filed a petition uh, for a writ of certiorari with the Supreme Court. Fortunately, the court declined to hear their case, um, I don't think we've heard the last of that, but anyway, the, the court declined to hear this particular case. Uh, the plaintiffs have been represented by the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a right-wing legal group funded by Christian conservatives uh, to oppose LGBT rights. And ADF, uh, amongst other uh, mischiefs, uh, is currently bringing a number of cases on behalf of cisgender students who are suing because they do not want trans students in their school bathrooms or locker rooms. Um, so we can certainly expect that the Supreme Court will be asked to take up these issues again in the future. And I think there's enormous potential uh, for harm uh, if that is to happen. Anyway, so I want to say a little bit about uh, the philosophical conceptions of privacy and how they can help us in understanding this problem. Um, so to, to determine whether someone like Alexis Lightfoot, uh, whether her objection to sharing her school bathroom with trans girls is a legally cognizable privacy violation, we can examine her claim through the prominent philosophical conceptions of privacy that are thought to justify a legal right to its protection. Uh, so there, as I'm sure most people here know, there is really no scholarly agreement about what privacy is exactly or why we have a right to it. Um, but in, in the paper, I discuss six prominent conceptions of privacy to determine whether they support a privacy right for Lightfoot and other cisgender objectors to exclude transgender women from women's bathrooms. Uh, and the scholarly conceptions of privacy that I look at in the paper are privacy as the right to be let alone, uh, privacy as limited access, uh, intimacy, privacy, control of information, personhood, and social networks. 
Um, time is limited today, so I'm just going to discuss two of these, uh, the theory of privacy as limited access and the personhood theory of privacy. Um, so let's start with limited access. Under this rubric, privacy exists to limit access to the self. So Ruth Gavison argues that we want to limit privacy, or we want privacy, I'm sorry, to limit, quote, our accessibility to others, the extent to which we are known to others, the extent to which others have physical access to us, and the extent to which we are the subject of others' attention. So in this conception, a person would have total privacy only if no one knew anything about her, no one paid any attention to her, and no one had physical access to her. Of course, as Gavison points out, that kind of perfect privacy could never exist in any society, right? We simply do not function that way as social creatures. But if we start from that, albeit imaginary vantage point, we can see that a person loses privacy as others gain access to information about that individual, pay attention to that individual, or gain access to that person. So privacy lessens as secrecy, anonymity, or solitude are diminished. So let's examine Lightfoot's claim about her school bathroom. When Lightfoot uses the bathroom facility, it might communicate some information about her to her school classmates, right? People who see her walking to the bathroom, they're going to learn that she needs to use it. Uh, they may also learn or see uh, that she identifies as a woman by her choice of bathroom facility, although they may have been aware of her gender identity already. So not clear they're learning new information there. Anyway, the important thing to note is that neither of these things that people may learn about Lightfoot based on her visit to the bathroom is affected by the fact that a transgender girl may also be using it. Lightfoot enjoys the same level of secrecy about herself, whether or not trans women are also permitted to use that bathroom facility. And nor does a transgender girl having access to the bathroom facility mean that anyone is going to pay any more attention to Lightfoot, right? People are not more likely to notice Lightfoot going into the bathroom facility because a transgender woman is permitted to use it. Lightfoot is not going to be looked at, scrutinized, or observed more closely um, so her level of anonymity in her school is simply not affected by the decision to allow transgender girls to utilize the women's bathroom. Lightfoot's level of solitude is also not affected by the decision to admit transgender girls to the bathroom facility. In a shared bathroom, one has to share the areas outside the stalls with other people. That is true whether or not transgender women are among those admitted to the women's bathroom facility. Lightfoot has the same amount of solitude that she had before, uh, whether or not transgender girls are allowed to use the same bathroom that she uses. So then with regard to all three aspects of privacy identified by the limited access conception, Lightfoot's privacy is not diminished by transgender women being allowed to use the bathroom facility. On the other hand, a transgender girl clearly faces a loss of privacy if she is forced to use the boys' bathroom being compelled to use the male bathroom is gonna out her as transgender. When she goes to the toilet mark boys, that communicates to her fellow students that she was designated male at birth. Um, it also likely provokes questions from the other children about why she is going to the, girl, the boys bathroom and not the girls facility. So the transgender girls classmates are both going to obtain information about her and pay attention to her as a result of her exclusion from the girls bathroom. So when we look at this issue through the limited access conception of privacy, we can see clearly that barring the transgender girl from the girl's bathroom threatens her privacy, but admitting her does not impinge upon the privacy of a cisgender objector like Lightfoot. Another important and influential theory of privacy uh, views it as protecting personhood. So the term personhood originated with Paul Freund, who used it to refer to, quote, those attributes of an individual which are irreducible in, in his selfhood. Um, and privacy as personhood protects people's rights to make autonomous decisions about how they want to live their lives without interference from the government or from other people. And the Supreme Court has embraced a personhood theory of privacy in uh, a number of cases, as Michelle uh, was referencing before, 
uh, in, in cases about reproduction, family foundation, marriage, raising children. And the court has explained that such matters are protected by a constitutional right to privacy because they, quote, involve the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime, choices central to personal dignity and autonomy, unquote. So let's suppose a cisgender objector, like Lightfoot, says that permitting transgender girls to use the girls' bathroom with her damages her personal identity because she defines herself as a traditionalist, right? Let's say she says that she believes in a God-given distinction between men and women. And so living in a community with transgender people is profoundly at odds with her beliefs, her uh, maybe her religious beliefs or her sense of morality, and it impinges upon her autonomy to define her identity according to more traditional or transphobic values. Now, Jed Rubenfeld has criticized the personhood conception of privacy for just this reason, pointing out that some people may define themselves or their personhood through intolerance, right? So he noted that recognizing the right of LGBT people to engage in same-sex relationships without being criminalized might be said to undermine the rights of a, quote, intolerant heterosexual, unquote, who can claim on personhood's own logic the critical to his identity is not only his own heterosexuality, but also his decision to live in a homogeneously heterosexual community. Okay, so let's think about that as applied to the circumstance we talked about before. Even if the Boyertown Area School District did exclude transgender girls from the bathroom, Alexis Lightfoot would still attend school with transgender students right? There would still be trans students in their school. They just wouldn't be allowed to use facilities that accorded with their gender identity. So the only difference to Ms. Lightfoot is that she would not have to spend the small percentage of her day that she is in the bathroom in the immediate vicinity of trans girls. So viewed in that way, it is clear that the impact of bathroom exclusion or inclusion uh, on Lightfoot's personhood rights, her ability to define herself, is negligible, right? Even if she constructed her entire identity around her opposition to the existence of trans people, the bathroom policy impacts that almost nothing, right? It's negligible impact. And again, we can contrast that to the impact upon a transgender girl who is excluded from the girl's bathroom at school, right? That, that young person identifies as a girl, is a girl, right? But when she's excluded from the girl's bathroom and forced to use one for boys, she is categorized as a boy by the school. She's even forced to identify herself as a boy by walking into the boy's bathroom. Even if the school allows her to express her female gender identity in other ways, for example, by wearing gender-affirming clothing or using a, a gender-appropriate name, the school is categorizing her essentially as a boy in a dress right, rather than the girl that she is, right, they're not, they're not allowing her to live her truth. Um, so again, under a personhood theory of privacy, we can clearly see that the transgender person's privacy is threatened by excluding her from the bathroom. But Alexis Lightfoot doesn't actually lose any privacy if the transgender girl is admitted. Um, okay, so what is really at stake here in these debates? What I contend is that similar uh, to what Kendra was talking about this morning, what traditionalists are really trying to do in these debates is maintain categories of men and women as a sharp binary that are grounded in perceived differences that they describe as natural or biological, right? They are defending a traditional conception of sex and gender roles, um, a worldview that assumes that people can be divided into two sexes, male and female, and that people who are designated male at birth are going to go on to have a male gender identity, to be masculine in presentation, and to sexually desire and dominate women. While people assigned female at birth are going to identify as women, be feminine in presentation, and sexually desire and submit to men. Um, and LGBT people, of course, threaten this understanding of the world um, because they identify as a gender other than the one assigned at birth, um, or flout traditional expectations of masculinity or femininity, or exhibit same-sex desire, all of which upend traditional sex roles. 
So when opponents uh, describe the privacy harm that they say women are going to suffer if transgender women are allowed into the women's bathroom, they are frequently raising a specter of sexual predation. But there's really no empirical support for this concern. Some communities like Baltimore, for example, have had laws forbidding discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity for years, and there have not been reports of sexual assaults in bathrooms as a result. This is a non-concern. Um, so why does it persist? It is grounded in misogynistic stereotypes that flow from the traditional gender roles I just described. That is that women are seductive objects who lure men into sexual violence. And in this view, women are responsible for preventing sexual assault by hiding themselves from men. If women don't dress or behave in a sufficiently modest way, they will be sexually assaulted because men have irresistible and understandable urges to sexually assault women. And so if we permit a person who is assigned male at birth to enter a women's bathroom, that presents a danger of sexual assault in this view, this utterly wrongful view, um, because that person is bound to have a natural urge to assault women, right? And these stereotypes are also perniciously raced as well. Um, so black trans women are subjected to some of the most vicious attacks in bathrooms and elsewhere because they are viewed as black men who are treated as sexual predators based on white supremacist racist stereotypes. Um, and, and that is what is animating this particular debate. Um, and given that these are nothing but stereotypes, acting on them will not make women or anyone else safer. Um, the notion that women are responsible for controlling men's urges to rape them is obviously extremely damaging to all people. And feminists have worked for years to try to change this perception. These campaigns are an effort to bring it back. Um, and in my view, rolling back LGBT protections um, to exclude transgender people is not going to protect women's privacy. Uh, these arguments are grounded in retrograde gender stereotypes that justify sexual assault um, and that endanger all people. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, and thank you for bringing us back to, you know, the intersectional nature of, of these concerns that we don't always think about when we see these reported in the news. Um, and, you know, I just read somewhere that 2021 was record-breaking for anti-trans legislation. And we've seen the attention sort of shift from these so-called bathroom bills to now these new bills targeting kids who wanna play sports in their school. So I'm hoping that we'll have time to discuss some of that in the Q&A. Um, all right, so last we have Jennifer Condon. I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you, Shanta, and thank you for your great work organizing, for all of the organizers, for all of you for being here today, and to my co-panelists, I really enjoyed um, learning about your compelling work. I want to say a couple of things before I get started about my project. Um, the first is, unfortunately, it appears I'm having some connectivity issues this morning. Yeah, my, the earlier presentations froze. Um, At-home tech support was not able to resolve it. But um, hopefully, um, I think it might have happened just then, um, and, and it'll be okay. Um, the other uh, initial comment I wanted to make is that I'm so excited to be able to present this piece today and to hear from all of you and hear your questions, because this is a new project, and I am going to be spending a lot of time um, this summer moving it forward. So I really look forward to um, hearing people's comments and, and questions for me. So the, the project that I'm um, going to talk to you about today is Uncaging Power in the a Movement in Prisons and Jails. And the paper is really an effort to um, imagine a transformative shift in how we think about and respond to the crisis of sexual violence against women that occurs in our prisons and jails. Um, I think this conversation, this um, need for thinking more broadly th than the ways that we have traditionally done is important for um, two reasons at this moment. You know, one is that women are the fastest growing um, group of people who are incarcerated. Um, women represent the, a smaller proportion than men without throughout our criminal justice system, but it's the, nevertheless the segment that's growing. And that's occurring mostly um, at our local uh, jails and um, um, county jails. 
Um, the second reason, we're about 20 years into um, Congress's efforts to respond to the problem of sexual violence in prison, the prison rape eliminate and um, the, uh, the regulations implementing it followed in 2012. And we are beginning to, to, to see that that effort has um, increased the number of reports of sexual abuse and violence within prison and jails. We don't have the data yet to really measure whether or not it has um, you know, met its goal of either um, decreasing, never mind eliminating, as the title of the act suggests, sexual violence. But anecdotally, um, we know that the, the problems of sexual violence are everywhere that we look in terms of our correctional institutions. And so my um, orientation to this issue and my interest in this project really stems from the um, experience that is happening in New Jersey, which is where I teach at Edna Mahan Prison for Women. Um, as some in the, the regional area may know or follow the, these issues, um, Edna Mahan um, is, is quite a case study of the um, entrenched nature of sexual abuse against women. And it really surfaces many of the issues that are um, endemic to the problem as it affects women. And that is that um, sexual violence in prisons and jails when it, women experience is a little bit different um, than the, the problem as it relates to men, male prisoners, which was the focus of co the congressional enactment. When women experience sexual violence in um, correctional settings, the perpetrators are most often staff and male correctional officers. Um, that does happen um, in, for male people who are um, incarcerated in male prisons as well. But when Congress enacted PREA, it was primarily um, in the early iterations of the act, thinking about the problem in terms of the violence that individuals who are incarcerated experience at the hands of other individuals who are incarcerated. Well, for women, it is the state that is um, subjecting them to sexual violence for, for the most part. And that um, really is part of the, the question about Priya's ability to fully respond to and target and resolve this problem. So for example, one um, intervention that Priya provides is to increase the surveillance of people who are incarcerated as a means of trying to prevent um, their, sec their, their harm. And if um, that intervention, though seemingly, you know, um, well-meaning, perhaps um, doesn't really fully grapple with the fact that the people doing the surveilling are often those that perpetrate the harm themselves. Um, and so, so what is going on at um, Edna Mahan Prison that I'm hoping through um, a very detailed case study can sort of frame the broader systemic problems and then some of my efforts to think more broadly about them. Well, Edna Mahan um, has this very interesting history of being um, thought of as sort of a, um, a uh, it, the model of what progressive approach to um, correctional responses for women could, could, could look like. Edna Mahan was um, the leader of the prison for 40 years. She was thought of as a progressive reformer. She favored really radical things at the time, at the beginning of the last century, such as open campuses and um, eliminating disciplinary um, policies and reaction to, to things that happened um, within the facility. And um, I, I'm sure even at that time, being incarcerated was a, a horrible dehumanizing thing. But Edna Mahan at least showed that she, she thought about these issues much more broadly. Sadly, um, the prison that now has her, you know, holds her name is really synonymous with a repetitive pattern of sexual violence perpetrated against the women held there. Um, the other interesting thing about Edna Mahan is often in the correctional setting, my clinic has done some work at a county jail involving um, all prisoners, not just women. But one of the things that um, you often see in the setting is that uh, it, um, en enabling prosecutions when abuses happen is virtually impossible. It's rare and it often there's a lot of resistance from those um, investigating and from prosecutors. There have been a number of prosecutions of sexual violence at Edna Mahan, and yet the problem remains entrenched. And once someone is fired, once somebody is prosecuted, a new correctional officer just takes their place. Um, 
people often describe this issue as being a culture problem. And um, I myself have done that. But I think we need to broaden our um, de description of what we mean by culture and what the root problem is that defines a prison that allows this repetitive um, occurrence of sexual violence to take place. So most recently in um, last year, in 2020, the Department of Justice issued a um, scathing report that documented um, a disturbing record and pattern of both substantiated sexual assaults by correctional officers at the prison, as well as a more varied but um, omnipresent um, pattern of sexual misconduct, including dehumanizing language um, inflicted against um, the women held there, um, viewing women when they were engaged in intimate activities like using the restroom or showering, um, groping women, sort of the, the litany of um, ways in which correctional officers can abuse their power and commit um, sexual abuse against women. Um, the, the, upshot of that report was that the state and the Department of Justice were engaged in negotiation to implement a federal consent decree to overhaul the policies and practices that led to this harm. Strikingly, even while that process was happening in January of this year, um, a, another episode of violence was publicly revealed that occurred at the prison a um, number of women were violently beaten by correctional officers um, that at an incident that stemmed from a cell extraction as the prison refers to it in a dehumanizing way. And um, women allege that during this incident, some of them were stripped of their clothes and also sexually assaulted. So why pay attention to this one prison and tell you all of that story? Well, I think it says something about the nature of the problem that while attention is trained on the facility, people are negotiating for changes at the prison. This incident occurs as if um, those who perpetrated it believed they would still be immune from accountability. And um, this, I think, is part of the, the shift we need to understanding the problem, that no amount of training, um, limitations on cross-gender searches, which has been a large part of the conversation about limiting the sexual abuse of um, women who are incarcerated, all of those things are resistant to the power structures that define um, prisons, and in particular, the power structures that are part and parcel of the gender dynamics that exist when women are incarcerated. And there are um, both male and female guards that are charged with guarding them. Um, Okay, so um, that is sort of the, the, the background of my interest. I do, I do hope to kind of do a very thorough study of the history of the many lawsuits, the prosecutions, the episodes of abuse at Edna Mahan to try to um, frame my discussion. But thinking about the role of privacy here and, and what it offers and what its limitations are, I think um, that that. We, we have to recognize that prisons are designed around the imperative of disempowering the individuals who are incarcerated and to eliminating their privacy. And the US Supreme Court has viewed surveilling prisoners as the means to keep securities safe as the very purpose of prisons. And I think um, efforts to argue for increased um, privacy protections are correct. They're not wrong, but I think we need to um, recognize the power imbalance that makes them um, impoverished as a means to actually change things. Um, so how might we think more broadly about changing this um, system? Um, and one possibility that my paper explores is whether Me Too as a, as a um, lesson can teach us anything that might be um, transferable and apply in the correctional setting. And so to, to ask that question, I think we first have to theorize Me Too. And so drawing upon the work of many on this, um, this call, um, I attempt to do that and um, identify at least three different ways of thinking about Me Too. One is that it represents, as Margaret Johnson has said, a narrative movement, and that it is, um, as many scholars have long recognized, 
narrative can often be more powerful than law. It can substitute for an inadequacy of legal process and procedures, and it can um, it can galvanize movement and support in ways that sometimes rights-based claims um, are inadequate. Again, thinking about the privacy-based um, responses to um, sexual violence in prisons. Um, so thinking of Me Too as, as narrative, as amplification, what does that suggest for us in the prison setting? Um, it should be noted in, in theorizing Me Too that Me Too is imperfect and that we have to acknowledge that Me Too, as, as the work of so many has, um, has emphasized, that it was primarily a, um, when it first began in 2017, a movement that privileged and prioritized the experiences of primarily wealthy white women who possessed a far, um, a far degree of power themselves. I think one of the contributions of Me Too was to um, illustrate that even with that privilege and power, women who were subjected to sexual violence and intimidation still confronted barriers to their ability um, to uh, avoid harm and to hold people accountable. But I want to be clear. I think Me Too, um, we need to be honest in our uh, critiques of it in the way that it did not sufficiently um, prioritize and elevate the experiences and voices of black and brown women and women who were experiencing sexual violence um, outside of um, white collar jobs or high profile industries, farm workers, women who are in the care industry, immigrant women who are experiencing sexual violence on the job and then also often at the hands of um, immigration officials too at the border. Um, so, so I wanna say that about me too, but come back to in spite of its flaws, what um, I think we have to take notice of its ability, its impact in, in moving um, seemingly fixed ideas and expectations about the intractability of sexual violence. And um, one possibility is to think of it as the power of narrative and apply that in the prison setting and think of whether there are ways outside of the PREA reporting requirements that could amplify voices and could provide some um, similar um, coalescing of power around the um, individual and collective narrative that is part of the um, description of sexual violence. So one possibility that I'm exploring is what about requiring um, exit surveys when people are released from prison as part of the discharge planning or uh, reentry process that separate from a person having to bring forward a claim of sexual assault or uh, misconduct would gather anonymous information about the sexual dy um, abuse dynamics that are at a facility if that information was made public. Um, might that be a way to replicate some of that um, public accounting um, that, that um, we've seen be somewhat effective in Me Too. Of course, this analysis has to recognize that, um, that the power of social media and the ways in which um, stories were um, echoed and reinforced is not going to work the same way in prison. But I think it is worth thinking about non-legal responses, ways in which people's stories can be shared and so that those stories are also um, uh, the response is that those stories matter as well and that they're no longer silenced as part of um, the, the acceptance of sexual violence, perhaps as inevitable within our correctional facilities. Um, the other two, very briefly, the other two theories perhaps of thinking about Me Too is maybe it is a, it is a uh, process of, um, uh, or I should say a non-legal ad hoc process of, of holding people accountable. Scholars such as Jessica Clark have talked about this and trying to define what the rules of Me Too are and has have said that this is really um, an, an, an ability for members of the collective community to decide when somebody's, when accusations of misconduct um, or violence dis, um make somebody disqualified to hold a position, um, either a position or a position of power. Um, that might be um, harder in the prison setting, but I think it's worth exploring 
um, options that could replicate it? What if prisons um, and jails pursued facility or pursue um, entities similar that we've seen in response to policing problems like community oversight boards? Could um, facilities that have like Edna Mahan that have a uh, documented history of sexual violence have that kind of board in which there are outside observers and um, members of the public and stakeholders who are um, having some oversight role. Now, those solutions have been problematic, and there's even in the policing context, but I think it's worth drawing those parallels and thinking them through. Um, so I'll, I won't say too much more. I'm sort of at the early stage of thinking through these solutions, but I think the goal and the motivation for the piece is to not accept the idea. Well, Me Too was effective in changing settled notions and expectations about uh, power dynamics and um, sexual abuse. Um, for people who are not incarcerated, but that would never work. That's too complicated for the prison setting. People who are incarcerated deserve the same kind of, and need the same kind of seismic shift in thinking and radical transformation of the um, culture or the expectations or the power dynamics that allow uh, sexual violence in the correctional setting to persist. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I just pressed all of the wrong buttons simultaneously somehow. Um, thank you, Jenny Brock. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, and you know, maybe you could start um, with this question that we have from Michelle Gilman about whether privacy is too privileged of a concept to really be helpful to marginalize people in the ways that you've all touched on in your papers. I think um, I think so. You know, I'm I'm hesitating because I think that has to be part of any, you know, um, real conversation about eliminating um, sexual violence um, in the setting I'm talking about or in any other. But I also don't want to give up at pri on privacy and just accept the other premise that um, people who are incarcerated should should not have any privacy protections. And I think you know the the intervention and under Priya that I described in which the sort of knee-jerk reaction is just to surveil um, people who are incarcerated more so um, is sort of an illustration of you know, where we go if we, if we um, think that privacy doesn't matter at all. I think it matters and we, we, should, um, we should pursue efforts to increase prisoners' privacy um, and we should continue the work of people have focused on cross-gender searches and the privacy dimensions of that. I guess my, um, my interest is in um, going beyond that too, to have more um, non-legal strategies to get at the power dynamics that make power uh, privacy meaningless unless you're paying attention to power as well. Yeah, in your paper, you um, identify this really fascinating tension between the, the empowerment that arose from the Me Too movement and, um, you know, sort of how it's at odds with the funda fundamental nature um, and goals of the prison system. Um, so I'm excited to see how you resolve that when you finish your paper. Um, do any of the other panelists want to tackle Michelle's question um, about whether privacy is too privileged? Breaking up, concept? I don't know if you can hear me or if I'm, oh, I'm sorry over here. can you guys hear me now okay sorry Shanta I, I, I was didn't okay. mean to speak over you I just it was breaking up in my end no problem at all I think Michelle um, is I think I, that question too. okay I think I heard the. oh okay Go ahead, Michelle. I just posted um, a link to a book in the chat. Um, so Kiara Bridges um, is a uh, law faculty member at Berkeley who wrote a book back in 2017 called The Poverty of Privacy Rights. And she really develops this idea of like, you know, who is entitled to privacy under law, who should have privacy, you know, how does privacy play out in some of these different areas? And so I recommend that to people who um, are interested in reading more about this and sort of the privilege of privacy and how it's really unequally distributed. Yeah, thank you so much. I was going to say the same thing. I think um, Kara Bridges' work is really incredible and really powerful. I guess, you know, from my perspective, I got interested in, in my project because 
um, you know, I felt privacy was being misused. And I think the reason why the concept of privacy is being misused is in this particular debate about LGBT rights more broadly and trans rights in particular is because it has so much purchase, right? People really care about privacy. Um, everybody agrees that it's important and that, and that you know, it, it's something that we should protect. The problem is who do we protect it for and in what circumstances? And so I guess I think, um, you know, we can't be naive about the fact that poor people and people of color and mar in marginalized communities, trans people don't have the same privacy rights as, as other people. I mean, I think we have to be, you know, clear eyed about that, but I think we can't abandon these concepts or say that, you know, that, that means, you know, these communities don't deserve privacy or that we shouldn't fight for it because I think it is so important. And, and it, it's essentially how we conceptualize so many really fundamental and important rights. And so I think, um, I think we have to be determined uh, and continue to to use these concepts as much as we understand that uh, you know there there is a, a great difference in the amount of of protection that is accorded people based on their level of power and privilege. There's no question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's a good segue for a question that I had for Michelle. You know, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about the idea that you alluded to in the beginning of your presentation about the privacy intrusions into means tested public benefits more generally and about this narrative of the undeserving poor that has historically been used as justification for those intrusions. Yeah, and so there are a lot of people on this call who've also written about this. Um, I know Michelle Gilman has extensively and others. So this actually goes back to like the beginning of the United States as a country. Like if you go back to the 1700s, the poor laws as they were called or the poor code, mm -hmm. Um, literally distinguished between undeserving and deserving women based on whether or not they were married, sort of like what their, you know, standing was, stuff like that, in terms of who could access. Well, that has permeated all throughout, you know, um, our history, including up to the New Deal and as stuff has played out more recently. And so it's things like the midnight home raids of um, cash aid recipients back, you know, in like the 60s to check to see if there was a man in the house who wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and um, Professor Bridges writes in her um, work, Poverty and Privacy Rights, about how when people go to apply for things like Medicaid assistance or medical assistance for pregnant women, they're asked all kinds of questions that have nothing to do with whether they need, you know, medical care, but, you know, questions about their sexual history, their partners, things like that. They just need to get to the doctor so they can have their exams. Um, and so this is present in, you know, food stamps applications, um, Medicaid applications, you know, um, cash assistance for families. And it really, I think, is based on the idea that like people who use these benefits aren't deserving of having these parts of their lives sort of protected from public scrutiny, because we don't do the same thing for things like, you know, people who get um, in state tuition benefits at public universities or people who, you know, apply for home mortgage interest, home mortgage interest deductions or, you know, farm subsidies. It is galling and very well documented. Yeah, um, it is really appalling when you look at the, the questions that people are asked, um, if you've ever had the opportunity to do that. Um, if you haven't, you should. You should. Um, it's it's really horrifying. Um, and you know, speaking of you know, transitioning a little bit to people that we often think of as deserving, as very deserving of protection. You know, kids. Um, you know, we're very careful to protect children in most contexts. Um, although, of course. Um, in schools, et cetera, they have less privacy rights. But Susan, you know, I talked about it a little bit um, when we were transitioning away from your paper about the switch in the anti-trans bills that we're seeing all of a sudden flooding um, through the states right now, um, trying to impose restrictions on trans children's ability to play sports and the types of intrusions that lawmakers are trying to subject minors to, you know, n including but not limited to physical inspection of their bodies. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about this switch and, and where, where you see the direction of these anti-trans bills going. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree. I think it's really alarming. Um, 
you know, there have been, I think, more than 80 bills uh, advanced by Republican lawmakers in 2021 or in introduced um, in state legislatures around the country, as you say, to either uh, criminalize or otherwise restrict uh, the ability of trans young people to seek gender affirming medical care um, that, you know, is really vital uh, for survival and support um, for, you know, some of the most vulnerable um, people in our community, um, and also to limit uh, trans kids' ability to participate in sports. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I mean, this is, it, it, it seems sudden, but of course it's not, right? It's the result of an organized campaign um, by actors like the Alliance Defending Freedom who write these bills and then propagate them out to Republican lawmakers around the country as part of a political strategy to create a, a kind of culture war that they think will galvanize their supporters and, and, um, and, and create momentum for political victories. Um, and I think it's, you know, kind of the shift away from the sort of bathroom uh, focused advocacy that I was talking about, you know, that I wrote, you know, my paper about, you know, uh, to, towards this, I think it, you know, is because of, of the polling, right? The, the polling, especially following what happened in North Carolina after the passage of HB2 and just the incredible organizing that was done uh, by people in the trans community um, and, you know, at all levels, right? To get corporations to boycott North Carolina because they passed their bill. Um, to, you know, to have the federal government support a legal challenge, um, you know, all of this incredible work, I think, you know, really sort of turned the tide um, against those kinds of bills and sort of turned the public against them. And so the, even the polling among Republican voters indicate that they don't support those measures anymore. But people, I think for the reasons that you're saying, because people care about kids and they want to protect kids. Um, the polling does suggest that people do feel alarmed at the idea that, you know, girls won't be able to fairly play sports because these people are going to have an unfair, you know, trans people are going to have an unfair advantage over them. Um, or, you know, trans kids are being harmed um, because their parents are taking them to get gender affirming medical care when, you know, the opposite is true. I think these are still politically salient and popular, um, particularly in communities like Arkansas, where we see these laws being passed. And so they're continuing to be um, push forward. And they, yeah, the, the privacy implications of all of this uh, are really, you know, profound, right? The idea that children and their parents are not able to access medical care that's appropriate to support them, to prevent suicide, to prevent other, you know, incredibly negative outcomes. Um, you know, the idea that, yeah, children in order to participate in school sports have to have their genitals inspected. I mean, this is horrific. You know, we have to fight this stuff. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that it's a cultural fight and it, it is incredibly painful. And the people who are suffering are trans people, you know, not just people who are excluded from medical care or sports, but who have to read this in the newspaper and understand that, you know, they're, they're being um, vilified and attacked to score political points. Yeah, it was, it was really um, alarming. And I, you know, when I was doing research, you know, after I read your paper, just to see the sheer volume of bills that have been, attempted or, or, you know, drafted this year alone um, is, is really, really shocking. Um, well, we're going to end there. Um, and I just want to say thank you all for your amazing and thoughtful work and really fascinating presentations. Um, it was a pleasure moderating your panel today. And I'm going to pass it back to Michelle Gilman. Thank you, Shanta, for moderating. And thank you, Michelle and Susan and Jenny Brooke for sharing your really important work, um, focusing on how privacy impacts some of our most marginalized people in the country who are often forgotten um, in privacy law debates. So just such foundational and important work. So I wanna highlight what's coming up this afternoon. Next, we're going to move into breakout rooms. These are our last breakout rooms for the day. And again, our goal is to engage in conversation and build community. In our first breakout room, <clears throat> we're going to be focusing on pitching and writing op-eds on privacy topics because uh, we are centered on applied feminism and part of applying um, theory to what we're seeing on the ground and vice versa is breaking beyond the bounds of academic discourse and moving into the popular press and sharing these foundational important path-breaking ideas with the general public. And so we're really fortunate that our colleague Kim Whaley is going to help facilitate that discussion. She's a former CBS News legal analyst. Um, 
She commentates frequently, uh, not only on TV, but in the press. She writes a lot of editorials for The Atlantic, Politico, The Hill, and other resources. And so she's just a really good guide to how to get your work out there into the public sphere so that it can have an impact on policymaking and public opinion. And in room two, we're going to be talking about what's next for a reproductive justice agenda. And that's a great segue into our afternoon panel that will be today at 145, where our speakers will be focusing on protecting decisional autonomy to shape identity and families. So we hope again, um, audience members, students, activists, advocates, professors, we will have a mix of folks in all rooms. So everyone should feel really, really comfortable in any breakout room that they attend. And at 1230, we will come back here for our keynote address by Fatima Gosgraves. We're so excited to have her here. She's the CEO and president of the National Women's Law Center and will give us a really good overview of what the policy and advocacy community is doing across the range of privacy issues um, that impact gender equity. So we are going to go to the breakout rooms in a second. Those should pop up here. And again, room one is about writing op-eds and room two is about what's new on the reproductive agenda, reproductive justice agenda, where, where do we go next? And they are open. So please join us in uh, the room of your choice. And again, feel free to come in five or 10 minutes. It, it doesn't matter if you need to go take a break right now, we'll be there. You don't have to be on time for this. This is not a formally structured uh, situation. Hi, Fatima, nice to see you. I'm gonna introduce you and then we'll get started. Does that sound good? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So welcome back everyone from our break and breakout rooms. We're so excited that you are joining us for our keynote speaker. We are thrilled to welcome Fatima Gosgraves. She is the president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. Her full bio is available on the conference website, but I'll give you just, just a taste of it. Um, she has served at the National Women's Law Center for more than a decade, previously as senior vice president for programming and vice president for education and employment. She's a co-founder of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, and we've talked about issues related to that today. Um, Gosgraves is an advisor on the American Law Institute Project on Sexual and Gender-Based Misconduct on Campus. She's widely recognized for her effectiveness in the public policy arena. She regularly testifies before Congress and federal agencies and is a frequent speaker at conferences such as ours and other public education forums. She appears regularly in print and on air as a legal expert on issues that are core to women's lives. Again, we are thrilled to have you here, Fatima. We can't wait to hear what you have to say on issues of privacy, and we're excited to hear about what the National Women's Law Center is working on. So I will turn it over to you. And after um, Ms. Gosgrave speak, we'll have a little time for Q&A. And so we'll welcome those questions in the chat. Thanks everyone, and thanks Fatima. Well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be with all of you. And I'm only sorry that we're not all together in person because this is the sort of thing that I definitely would have wanted to uh, be able to head over to Baltimore to be there. And thank you all for taking the time to really be at this conference and challenge our notions of privacy and, and how it affects the lives of women and girls in this country. And that's that's really what I'm gonna talk about. Before I begin though, um, I, I really do wanna just name what a week this has been. Uh, it's a week in some ways that has been reflective of the last many years where we have had to hold on to glimmers of hope and even um, dare I say slight wins and real challenge and discouragement and pain. Um, and, and I sort of sometimes think that we are in the midst of living through a moment that maybe I'd rather be a little bit later in history and looking back on it and thinking about what was that time like. Um, but that's not where we are. We are in the midst of this. We are in the middle of an economic crisis, a racial reckoning, a time where state violence is high, a time where community insecurity 
is low and a time where persistent and unending attacks that are steeped in white supremacy and misogyny feel unending. And so I just wanna name and acknowledge what it is like to live in that moment and be in it rather than be somewhere far ahead looking back. And, and that I, I'm sure it is on your hearts and minds today too. Uh, at the National Women's Law Center, we are an organization that advocates across multiple issues that impact the lives of, of women in, and girls in this country with a focus on women of color, of, around LGBTQ people and low-income women and families. And we drive that change in the courts and in public policy and in our society. And next year we turn 50 in doing that work. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie that uh, doing this work is not easy. It's especially not easy during the sort of weeks and months and years that we have had most recently. Uh, but it's also rare to find a civil rights lawyer that wakes up believing that change isn't possible. And so true to form, I wake up each day with a clear understanding of the role of the National Women's Law Center. And I am really moved to do this work and in this period, in part because of the activists in this country who in ways that feel unending and are ever inspiring are fighting for a future that doesn't exist today and reminding me and all of us that change is possible and who have been dr driving tremendous change, tremendous change culturally, tremendous public policy change, who have been driving extraordinary wins in our courts and beyond. Um, so, you know, this conference on privacy is, is happening amidst an era of movements. It's a time where we're asking court questions on whether the country can meet the promise of racial justice. We're asking where we are in the midst of rewriting old narratives that have shaped what is possible. These narratives have shaped whether we can be safe and equitable at work and at school. They've shaped the idea around whose responsibility is it to ensure that people in this country can both care and work, which most women do. Um, they've shaped the narratives that around whether or not families should have what they need to thrive from high quality housing to incomes that can sustain their families. And we're shaping the stories that have informed whether and when and on what terms people in this country can parent. And as I was preparing for the conversation today, I thought a lot about the ways in which privacy shows up today in our cultural narratives. And I... I thought about it and I thought, well, is there a similarly charged and unending and marching in the streets movement around privacy? And I was left wondering whether part of the challenge, and I answered that I didn't think that it was the case and that part of the reason that is, is that the way we have conversations around privacy are too limited that we're often too focused on narrow ideas around privacy, or we are not connecting notions of privacy to broader understandings of justice. And that as long as we continue to do that, it's going to be hard for our understandings of privacy to be the ones that drive people in this moment to the streets and to take the sort of action we need them to do. And, and so I, I, I will say that my remarks today are really gonna be grounded a bit in that belief. And I thought about it actually though, because it, part of it in our narrow definition of privacy is, is this one that maybe is limited to um, the personal right? Uh, the last year, there's been lots of conversations around things that might make privacy seem like an isolated idea rather than a collective idea. Or other words that sometimes are tied to privacy like confidentiality or solitude or quiet um, are, are ones that might feel disconnected from people's lives in this moment. And 
and I was forced a little bit to look at some of the definitions of privacy um, and the ability to be free and, and notions of freedom and the range of types of freedoms. And ideas of freedom, I think, get closer to the conversations people are having at a peak frenzy right now. But I have to confess that the freedom stories that we tell ourselves in, inside of a privacy framework or have often, you know, the freedom to make decisions for myself or my family, the freedom to build the family that I choose, the freedom to make medical decisions for myself and my family and more. Um, those freedom stories disconnected from the stories of movements today, stories that that are steeped in equity and equality and, and justice. Um, may seem too limited. So why don't I get a little bit more granular? I, you know, of course, and I'm sure you've heard today, having seen the broader agenda, when we're thinking about privacy and um, the framework of access to reproductive health care, it's, it's very much, of course, steeped in the Constitution's protected protections around liberty and privacy that have undermined, underlied fundamental rights related from contraception and procreation to marriage and family relations to child rearing and intimacy. Um, and limitations on the right to privacy including a person's right to be free from government intrusion in those personal affairs in some ways, that is how we had described reproductive freedom for maybe too long. Um, but I think we have learned a lot that the stories of activists who are squaring freedom with notions of justice get a little bit more at the heart of what we might be seeking. Freedom by itself won't ensure equity and access to care or guarantee reproductive justice more broadly. Freedom by itself won't ensure that large sections of area of cities aren't without um, a maternity ward, aren't without medical care, that um, rural spaces have access to, to the same sort of care that urban spaces do. Um, freedom might not allow you to um, investigate the reasons behind a maternal mortality rate that is extraordinary or the reasons behind infertility rates that vary so deeply by race and by class. Freedom might not allow you to get yourself to the point where care is not only accessible, but affordable. And it might not allow you to take on things like restrictions that have been around for decades under a longstanding compromise uh, around uh, how Medicaid funds and other federal funding is spent, whether you're talking about Hyde or other restrictions. And, it, and freedom might not solve for the hateful rhetoric and shaming that people in this country endure as they seek to access the care that they may even legally be entitled to. And so when I think about our, our opportunity to square notions of freedom deeply with an ability to be equal in this country and that our ability to be equal in this country is bound up in our freedoms, I get a little bit more excited. I get excited about ensuring that people's lived experiences are appropriately grappled with inside an understanding of the other sorts of power and inequities and systems of impressions that make it really difficult for people to access the care that we need. And so what I would propose is that in and out of reproductive health care conversations that we on purpose put together notions of privacy, notions of freedom with notions of equality and, and justice. I am excited that 
you guys have had conversations today about the Times Up Legal Defense Fund and the work of harassment and violence and, and Me Too, I assume and presume. Um, and I, I wanna take us back and dig in a little bit there and think about how we have been naming and, and talking about privacy in, in that conversation. You know, one of the reasons that uh, I think harassment and violence in this country has endured for so long is that for too long, it was considered a totally private matter, an issue between a couple of people that should not be talked about. And the assumptions actually that harassment and violence are a private matter also are those same assumptions that undergird a culture of shame that is a part of the reason why people haven't spoken out. In fact, when Me Too went viral, the thing that was so heartening and exciting about it is that it was not private at all. It was a conversation, frankly, uninterrupted around the harassment and violence that women in particular were enduring. And I'm not saying there weren't efforts to interrupt it. In fact, there were actually lots of efforts to interrupt Me Too in those early days. And they were flitted away because it was so long overdue that people have this conversation. And you may have remembered that what, the, what erupted on social media, Tron and Burke's longstanding framework around me too, when it erupted on social media, people continue to have those conversations in small groups and in organized spaces, um, sometimes still in whispers as we were disrupting this idea that this is an issue that was only a private matter for two people. At the same time, it is totally common and because of survivor privacy, to have a range of things that continue to keep harassment and violence quiet and private and in the shadows. One of the areas where there has been a rich and meaningful debate is around the use of non-disclosure agreements. I tend to take the role that I follow in all of my work, the lead, the and guide of survivors. And for those who are naming that core to their willingness and ability to come forward and, and sift and seek a shift for themselves, that privacy is a part of that. I wanna be there exactly by their side fighting for that too. And at the same time, I'm fully aware that part of that need and desire for a lot of privacy is for sure bound up in the shaming and blaming that is rooted in our longstanding disregard and disbelief of survivors. And so even as we are opening the window and creating more spaces and places for people to tell their stories publicly, to um, be out there in ways that are non-private, I feel very protective of survivors' uh, uh, um, desire to sometimes be private. So even as Me Too has continued to undercut the idea that harassment and assault should be kept quiet and kept private and has empowered survivors to identify not only what happened to them as a personal problem and a personal challenge, but a structural problem, a problem of abuse and a problem of power and a problem of accountability, um, we, you know, we stay grappling with that. Uh, you know, the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, I should, I should just name so people know because we want you to continue to be a part of it. It offers um, not only legal assistance to people who are, have experienced harassment or related retaliation at work. It also offers media assistance to support survivors as they challenge the notion that harassment should be kept private. 
So we were grappling with the two of those things together and doing so at a time where I think meaningfully we are trying to square these notions of privacy with broader understandings of equity and justice with probably equity and justice being our leading edge driver. The, the, the non-disclosure agreement actually raises a broader issue around how our sex discrimination or really or any of our civil rights laws intersect with understandings of privacy. Um, you know, that is a, a, a matter of, of which we are having battles in, in real time with the um, rules that have been put in place by some of our federal agencies. You know, there's, there's sort of an approach that is longstanding around what happens if you file a, a charge, say with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, that the understanding is that fi the filing of that charge is typically a private matter. It is a thing that you could do without it um, being accessible to the public. Um, and, and it is different from the phase and the stage when you are in court, uh, unless there is work taken to ensure that people have permission to file, say, using their initials or some other anonymous moniker. Um, the idea of filing a court case is, a, is inherently, in most instances, a way to create a public record. So there's a lot of good that comes from filing cases. Um, sometimes uh, the understanding of an institution that has failed or an individual that has failed becomes known to others in the public. But there is a tremendous amount of risk that survivors will face future discrimination because their name is now associated with harassment and violence. And sometimes people want to see a shift in their experience, but what they tell us is, I don't actually wanna be known as a survivor. I don't wanna be a public person who has experienced discrimination. I just want my experience to change. And so thinking about how privacy and the way in which we enforce our laws through litigation or through agencies, thinking about how um, those who are, find themselves on the other side are well aware of that demand for privacy or that risk and worry that retaliation or further discrimination will occur. That ends up getting used in the context of any ability to enforce our laws. Um, what, another issue that sometimes comes up when we think about privacy and the enforcement of our laws, especially around survivors, is around how the discovery process is used. It is sometimes used in an abusive ways to, to request information that the person who has made the charge feels very um, Person, things as personal information, information that they thought would never get out there, requests for things like medical records or therapist records or private information to prove um, that there was something else that this, that this person actually may have experienced harassment, but really what has them so upset or has their life turned upside down is something else in their life. Or to do the thing that has been really successful um, up until this time and, and that we're hoping to disrupt more and more, to do the thing where you demonstrate that actually that this person is either lying or crazy or both. And I'm using that word crazy on purpose here because that is the trope that survivors have had to grapple with over time, that the experiences that they face are in their heads, that the experiences um, that they name are not true, and those long sticky narratives around both are extremely hard to disrupt, although I will say we are making some progress. And we're making progress 
through the lens, not no, so much of privacy, but through the lens of equity and justice. Since Me Too went viral, more than 50 states, um, including places like Tennessee, but also places like California have created rules around sexual harassment to create safer workplaces, including whether particular cases can be kept confidential through NDAs. There's continued disagreement around what the precise right outcome there should be, but I really do start with and lead with the idea that survivors should never have to choose between protecting their privacy or seeking justice. And courts should never let procedural technicalities get in the way of our civil rights, which are new civil rights, which are longstanding and well-worn. And our focus on harassment and violence can't be limited to the ways in which privacy is stolen through litigation settlements. Our focus really has to be around, are we shifting the way people experience the spaces where harassment and violence occurs, whether that is at work or in schools or in housing or in homes. I also, and I, and I deeply want to leave some time for, for questions, but I want to name um, another space where we're having a really interesting and robust debate around the connection between privacy and our broader civil rights laws. And that space is in the area of pay discrimination. You know, when we think about what it is that people are paid in this country, um, there are longstanding cultural notions where people feel that pay and the pay that they receive is very private. You know, there are lots of studies that people are deeply uncomfortable talking about their pay. And some employers have set up rules that reinforce and graft on top of that cultural expectation by saying you can't talk about pay. Some of them require employees after, or contractors as a part of getting the job before you even have any information about what the setup is to sign that away. You sign a form among many other first day forms and one of those forms ends up being, I will not talk about my pay. The challenge around that is it means the only person who has an understanding about pay is the person making the pay decisions. And the giant power inequity there with the employer having all the information and all the decision making authority means that bias is allowed not only to exist, um, that that uh, pay secrecy actually fuels the bias. It also doesn't lead to greater employee satisfaction. It turns out, and this has been studied, that when people don't have the information about their pay, they make up narratives in their head about what they make versus everyone else. So they assume both that they are, and, and, and I'm, I'm hoping this resonates with some of you. They assume, most people assume a few things. First, that they are paid too little. Most people believe whatever the case is that they, it's very rare that people think I am paid spot on or maybe I'm paid too much. That is not a notion that any of us really have in our heads. Most people also think that they are a little bit better than that person down the hall. And when you put those things together, that I'm paid too little and I'm kind of better than that person down the hall, it actually doesn't help you to have so much secrecy that you then begin to resent the idea that you are paid <laughs> less than the person down the hall when it actually might not be true. So for employers who have these really rigid closed pay practices, the truth is they aren't really helping themselves. It is also the case though, um, that the pay secrecy rules have been a way to not just force privacy that maybe should or shouldn't be there, 
but they have been a way to keep people from having rich conversations around their pay. Because sometimes when people start gathering and comparing notes, then they find out, wait a second, how is it that I have been paid so little? And I will tell you, if you look at some of the case law, the pay discrimination case law, the thing that I always find really disturbing about it is, is that people usually find out about it by accident. Somebody happened to leave a pay stub out by accident or printed something and it was on the copy machine. Or, you know, people are out for drinks after work and someone mentions they got a bonus and nobody else got that bonus. So it's these casual ways of sharing information that have led to enforcement of our pay discrimination laws. And what that means is we have laws that are dramatically under enforced and everyone knows it, including employers. So the risk of underpaying women and underpaying people of color is actually not that big of a risk because you're unlikely to get caught is sort of the longstanding and traditional approach. And when you graft onto that both pay secrecy rules or pre-dispute confidentiality clauses or other rules that basically mean you don't find out about pay and you're unlikely to figure out how to challenge it. We have a real problem that is both steeped in the notions of privacy, but also ignores our longstanding rules that are steeped in justice and equality. So what gives me hope around the conversation we're having today around pay and the moves that have been happening at the state level is that people are grappling with that and balancing that in new ways. The pay secrecy policies, the rules that basically say that you can't talk about your pay, those for contractors, there's an executive order that is one of the few things that on, on workplace discrimination that was not undone in the Trump years, that still persists. So federal contractors cannot maintain those rules. And we now have people at the Department of Labor who will be serious about enforcing that. The EEOC has also made clear that it's sort of a rare circumstance where that they can imagine where this sort of rule has, is, will be allowed. And more than a dozen states have moved forward and also changed their laws on this front. But in the same way that uh, we think it's important to get rid of those formal rules, part of what we understand is that sunlight around pay is going to be an important measure. And there are a bunch of measures that states and local governments have been taking to increase transparency around pay. Sometimes that is just requiring in job postings that a, um, a specific amount be posted or a median amount or the lowest rate of pay so that people aren't totally in the dark when they're trying to figure out what the back and forth should be around pay. Sometimes that uh, sunlight comes in employers require, being required to analyze their own pay and report it to someone else. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission had put forward a rule at the end of the Obama administration that required just that for employers that sized 100 or more, that they report their pay data by race and by gender. We spent many years in the last administration um, litigating around that rule, the, round take, the taking down of that rule <laughs> um, uh, successfully. And now the EEOC, which was required to collect the data, will be able to do some things that give us a better sense of what's happening in different sectors and also better target that enforcement. That becomes important for two reasons. One, employers will now have a different incentive to look at their own pay they are unlikely to want to turn over information to the EEOC that reflects discrimination. 
And so sometimes having an incentive to do an analysis and make corrections can lead to differences in real time for people. But it also will make the EEOC's enforcement stronger and smarter around pay discrimination, which shifts a little bit the problem we have overall, which is that if you discriminate in pay, it's unlikely that you will get caught. So now we have shifted that balance a little bit. And I just want to name each of those things still respects the culture of privacy around pay. It is a thing that I struggle with a little bit because should, you know, should there be, but I'm acknowledging that there is. So none of the laws that I have seen would say, you know, Fatima Goss graves that are that, that my pay should be listed, although maybe that's a bad example because as a head of an organization, my pay is very public. But in general, you're not going to walk into a kitchen. Um, or whatever the virtual kitchens are these days and see an individual's name listed by their salary. But there will be more and enough information for those decisions to be smarter. And maybe as we look ahead, the culture of secrecy that has blanketed our understandings of pay won't be as stark and as deep. I'm gonna say one last thing about pay. And that is, um, some folks thought, well, if we just get rid of the pay secrecy rules, that will be enough. And people will have one-on-one -on -one conversations with each other, and that will put a different level of information. But the, one of the things that we know from the research is that when, right now, when people tend to talk about pay, they do it in groups that are same gender. So women tend to talk to each other around pay, men to, tend to talk to each other around pay. And I will just say that women are talking to the wrong group of people if, if part of what they're trying to figure out is the overall <laughs> sense of who is, is, is being paid and what the market is internally. And so that alone is not gonna be enough. Our view pretty strongly from a justice perspective is we have to shift employers incentives to basically pay people correctly the first time. So I know I've covered a lot of different topics today and I'm looking forward to any questions that you have, but I will leave you with this one thing and, and that is that privacy, much like power, doesn't have to be a word that makes people squirm, but if we really wanna shift power and use privacy as a legal concept that can help to bolster gender justice to new heights, it cannot be on its own. It has to be paled, paired really with values of equity and with justice. And I think guided by the stories and experiences that people are naming today in movements, the stories that are driving people to take fundamental actions um, to ensure that freedoms are really open to all and that our notions of privacy are intertwined with our fundamental ability to live and learn with safety and, and dignity. So thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me today and having me today. And I hope folks have some questions. Thank you so much. Um, audience members, you can put questions in the chat or raise your hand. We're happy to call on you. And I just want to thank you so much for that rich exploration of privacy issues across a range of different topics and areas. I think what you've really shown is that privacy is deeply contextual. It doesn't hold um, its own meaning. It's attached to other important variables. In some circumstances, privacy norms can be beneficial. In others, they're very harmful and detrimental. Um, and that privacy is so linked to power. It's about who grants privacy, who seizes privacy, who receives privacy, and we can't disentangle privacy discussions from discussions of power. So that's just such an incredible and useful framing. I see that Professor Margaret Johnson has a question, um, and so I will turn it over to her for that. Thank you so much um, for this incredible talk. I actually have a lot of questions, but I think I'll go with the last point you were talking about with equal pay, which so important having been a former 
uh, employment lawyer, this idea of pay secrecy. And I'm lucky to work at a public institution where our pay is public, um, but that's not the case, right, if it's a private institution. My question to you, and I absolutely agree with this idea that um, privacy needs to think about moving towards justice and it needs to be uh, an intersectional movement with equality movements, equity movements, justice movements, dignity movements, absolutely. And, I, and yet we keep bumping up against the wall when we think about legal rights and even Equal Pay Act, Title VII, Title IX, which are not intersectional laws. They are unidimensional laws. So we can't look at the intersectionality of the stories that are being claimed. For instance, the disproportional, disproportional effect on say black women in the workforce uh, with sexual harassment or underpaying. What do you or the National Women's Law Center see as the future for how we make our laws conform with the reality of people's lives? Because of course we all occupy multiple dimensionalities um, along gender, race, gender identity, and so on. So how do we help get our laws that are stuck in this unidimensional view where you have to bring a sex claim or a race claim um, into a more realistic, more recognizing of the power uh, dynamics at play in these structures from schools to workplaces and so on to acknowledge and remedy intersectional harms. I mean, it's a, 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 a really great question. I appreciate you asking it. I mean, some of it is steeped in the, the, the theories that Kimberly Crenshaw has outlined for so long around um, moving our laws to a place that, that actually allow for an intersectional theory. I think in the Bostock decision from last year, there is, um, and whether they intended to give us as much hope as we believe there is, there is uh, a real sense that you, uh, under the same framework, you can acknowledge multiple forms of discrimination happening at once. That was a really important statement and acknowledgement from the Supreme Court. And we've already seen some lower courts take that up and name that, well, yes, of course, you could be having a sex discrimination and an age discrimination happening at once and we should think about what this looks like for older women for example um so i am hopeful that 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 opens a tiny window for us to have that sort of legal analysis and i think from a policy perspective that it requires if you start from the perspective of who is most impacted here, and it is one of the reasons why we continue to lean into uh, the data around pay disparities in this country, not because we think the data around pay disparities match the level of pay discrimination, but because we see it as both a measure of overall inequality and a call to focus on where the disparities are the largest. And so we, we both mark the overall equal pay days, which is com a comparison of all women and all men and an analysis of the pay disparity. And we mark the different points in year by race and gender together. And in doing so, we look at the suite of solutions that we think would make a difference in closing the wage gap. And many times when I'm talking about the overall pay gap, I start with the fact that what our data tells us is that Latinas in this country lose over a million dollars over the course of their lifetime to the wage gap. And I start there because the wage gap is the largest there. And places like, for example, California and Washington DC, which actually have some of the smallest overall pay gaps, 
have the largest overall pay gaps for Latinas and for Black women. And so it suggests that the answer is not steeped in a single solution. And part of what I think uh, an approach that actually um, centers those who are most impacted, it forces you to expand the solutions that are on the table under this broader framework, which I will say is a very popular framework. I think it's a popular framework for a lot of reasons, but it is a very popular framework and it's actually our obligation to ensure that people are, are behind the range of solutions that would actually make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. I have a question that an audience member asked me to relate to you, and it relates to you mentioned how it's a new day at the Department of Labor in terms of you know enforcing some pre-existing regulations. And they'd like to know it's a new day across the federal government, right? In Congress, in the agencies, and in the White House. So what are you um, predicting in terms of advances in gender equity? And how is the National Women's Law Center um, sort of capitalizing on this change and thinking about moving forward? Because the climate is so radically different than what we had for the past four years. Yeah. Um you know, I think a lot about what is our stance. And the last four years, there were many points in time where I felt like our movement generally was sort of holding up this wall and trying to stop the worst of harm, the worst of things from happening, um, and not doing as much work launching us forward beyond the period. It was really, you know, but when we launched the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, my staff was thrilled because we were doing proactive work in a time where so much of our work was just holding the line, slowing things down, keeping people safe. And that is hard work to do day in and day out. And so now we are in this period where uh, and I was just telling someone, I don't actually really envy the administration in this moment at all, because the task that they have is to not only undo some really harmful things that, have, that are still operating in real time, and that many of us have litigation around that continues and are not letting up. We in the Trump years had to file lawsuits over their Title IX sexual violence rule, over undoing the equal pay rule, over their rule around religious refusals that expanded the numbers and types of providers who could refuse to provide care for virtually any reason, under their contraception rule, under their dismantling of the um, the section 1557, which is the law that bans sex discrimination in healthcare programs and activities. It, you know, <laughs> so they have to undo a lot and fast because right now people are not getting the care that they need. They're not feeling safe in institutions. They aren't enforcing their civil rights laws in the ways that they should. And that would not be enough. It, no one is in a campaign marching in the streets to go back to we where we were five years ago. That is not a plan, right? And in fact, the last year, which has left us in a place of a time where there is such deep need and such deep pain, where women's share of the workforce has gone back to 1980s levels and that is directly tied to our inability to have the meaningful care infrastructure in this country, we need a launch ahead. So we need them to both undo a range of things and quickly, and <laughs> to launch ahead with, with, very, with real seriousness. And so one of the things that get, has me really excited is what I am seeing in terms of budget allocations where you spend dollars really matters. They have put significant investments in civil rights enforcement. The jobs plan that was outlined a couple of weeks ago has historic investment in civil rights enforcement. That is a huge deal coming, that would be a huge deal at any time, it's a huge deal coming off of these last four years. Some of it is in people. And we have Jenny Yang, who will be leading um, the Department of Labor's 
Office of Federal Contracts Compliance Program. She's one of the leading civil rights lawyers in our country and the former chair of the EEOC. And if there's anyone ready to hit the ground running on this question, it is Jenny Yang, right? We have Vanita Gupta, who was confirmed just this week after enduring a horrific campaign against her. She will be the first civil rights attorney to be the Associate Attorney General for Civil Rights at the Department of Justice. We have Kristen Clark, who if I have anything to say about it and our movement has anything to say about it, will be confirmed <laughs> to be the first woman confirmed and the first black woman in the role to lead the civil rights division at the Department of Justice. And when I think about, you know, I could go on and on with some of the people, including who are at the White House, who have dedicated their careers to these issues. Catherine Lehman leading the conversation around race equity in the in not just the White House, in the entire federal government is exactly who you want there. And so I will just say that I am hopeful on many of the people pieces. I am hopeful on the policy front. I am impatient on the timing front just because I think our country can't afford to wait. Um, and I don't envy the work of, of doing it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm feeling very inspired. Again, just a reminder to our audience, and I see some of our students out there, if you'd like to ask a question, you can chat it or raise your hand and just ask it yourself. But I did get a question from a student who asked me to relay it to you. And what they want to know is, as law students, what is a fruitful role that they can play in the movements that you're talking about now? They don't have their JDs yet. They're on their way. They want to lay the groundwork um, to have an impact in the future, but they want to also have an impact now. So I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what is the advice you give for law students in engaging in this ongoing struggle? Well, the first thing is, I definitely don't think you have to be a lawyer to engage. And so we have lots of people around the country who, that is the thing about movements that who have just decided to be a part of it, who have raised their perspective, who contribute in a whole range of ways outside of institutions. Um, so that is one thing that anyone can do in and out of law school. Um, I, al I also think if you are passionate about these issues, interning and either during the academic year or during the summers with the justice organization that moves you really makes a difference. Even if you don't know that's where you're gonna spend your life and career, I would argue that your life and career will be better for having spent time there. And, um, and so I hope people uh, make that time and find that space for them. But even if you find yourself in a, in a place that is not directly a, and always uh, working on justice questions, I hope that you still find a way to show up for these issues using your eventual law degree, we, you know, at the, with the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, we have a lot of law firms who are a part of it in a range of ways. And I'm confident the reasons that they are is because their associates and partners and summer associates wanted them to be. And it has been a way for them to be involved, to help with screening, um, on intake to help with understanding legal issues. We have one law firm that generally was not doing this line of work, but they had a robust defamation practice and they are working a number of them as our first to go to place when we get intakes that are related to defamation around their harassment claims. And so I would say you can think broadly about how to show up and participate in this. And, um, and I hope I hope everyone does. That's great advice. Thank you so much. I think we're like nearing the end of our time. So we just want to extend our thanks to you again for providing such a powerful framing and also such inspiration. This is, you know, last year, if you would come, it would have had a different tone and a different feel. And so it's really, I mean, I'm sad we got put off for a year by the pandemic, but I'm happy to hear these words and 
um, your words of encouragement and also sort of the in-depth analysis of the issues at a time where I feel we can have more of an impact. It's more receptive. This is our moment. Students, this is our moment. We have to seize it. And we're working hard at the law school to give you the tools to do it. So Fatima, thank you so much again for joining us. We appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness. And we hope to bring you back to the law school in person one day soon. Um, I think we'll be back next fall. So hopefully we'll have you back as an in-person guest. Thank well, you thank so you much. for having me. It's been a pleasure. And it's been good to be with all of you. And also to see some um, old friends who I haven't seen in a while in this audience too. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. So we will take a 15 minute break and then we will come back at 145 for our third and final panel on protecting decisional autonomy to shape identity and families. We have an incredible lineup of speakers. And so grab yourself a snack, grab yourself a drink and we'll see you back in 15 minutes. All right, I want to welcome everyone back for our third panel at the Applied Feminist Legal Theory Conference. We'll be talking about protecting decisional autonomy to shape identity and families. And we're very fortunate that Emily Poor will be moderating the panel for us. She is teaching at the University of Baltimore right now in the Civil Advocacy Clinic, and it's my pleasure to co-teach with her. So Emily, with that, I will turn it over to you to introduce the panelists. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, so we have a really fantastic panel right now protect, on protecting decisional autonomy to shape identity and families. Um, and we have a great group of panelists. Uh, Deborah Brake is the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development, the John E. Murray Faculty Scholar and Professor of Law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Professor, Professor Brake was previously Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center. Um, Joanna Grossman is the inaugural Ellen K. Solander Endowed Chair in Women and the Law and Professor of Law at the Southern Methodist University Denman School, or Denman School of Law. She currently serves as the president of the board of Jane's Due Process, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to provide legal representation to pregnant minors seeking abortion and to provide Texas teens with greater sexual and reproductive autonomy. Professor Grossman and Professor Brake's article, Reproducing Inequality Under Title IX was recently published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Gender. Next, we have Laura Kessler, who is a professor of law at the University of Utah. Professor Kessler serves as a, served as a Fulbright Senior Scholar in Israel in 2018 to 2019, where she researched the human rights impacts of Israel's state-enforced religious family law and taught comparative family law at Haifa University's Global Law Program. She's a co-author of the Leading Gender in the Law casebook, Women and the Law. Next is Anibal Rosario Lebron, who is a Puerto Rican law professor, attorney, linguist, and photographer. He's an assistant professor of lawyering skills at the Howard University School of Law, and I believe he will be joining the faculty at Rutgers in the fall. Um, he's a member of the board of directors of LATCRIT and has previously taught at the Universidad de Puerto Rico, Hofstra University, University of Louisville, and the Universidad Interamericana. Um, our final panelist, Lynn Liu, is an associate professor of law and co-director of the Economic Justice Center at um, CUNY Law School. She was previously associate director and assistant acting professor of lawyering at um, the NYU School of Law and was a litigator at the National Center for Law and Economic Justice and the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law. Um, so I'm very excited to hear from all of our panelists about decisional autonomy and various aspects of um, creating our identities and families. Um, first, we'll have um, Professor Brake and Professor Grossman talk about their recently published article. Um, and you should be able to share your screen at this point, I believe. I actually will not be sharing my screen. So oh, great. If you want to skip that step. That's sure. Fine. Um, and just for anyone with questions, we will have a Q&A at the end. Please feel free to put questions in the chat as we go along um, and I will keep track of them. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to all the folks involved in the conference. I can't tell you how happy I am to be here today to be talking about <clears throat> applied feminism. Having taught my last class Wednesday, 
review session Thursday, examine midnight last night, I'm really ready to be thinking about applied feminism. So <clears throat> I'm going to go first and keep myself to uh, only half the time so that my good friend and colleague Joanna can um, step in and talk about her piece uh, of the um, argument and article that, that we're doing here. But I thought I'd start by talking about why we wrote this and then um, get into a little bit more of the argument. So this is not a law reform piece uh, so much as it is a critique. Um, so I don't know if you can see on Zoom, but I'm wearing my RBG collar dissenting earrings because it is a critique. Um, <clears throat> and when I was you know, thinking about what I wanted to say, at the conference about why we wrote this, something occurred to me that I don't think I even shared with Joanna about. I think why for a long time this has been on my mind. This is one of those stories that you're a little embarrassed to tell because, um, you know, at the time I was so shocked. I, in hindsight, I wish I would have done more. But I remember this is a long time ago, about 20 years ago, dating myself here, sitting in a faculty meeting. And hearing one of my older male colleagues, who's now retired, so I think it's okay to tell this story without names, uh, you know, it's being recorded on Zoom. One of my older faculty colleagues, uh, who was retired, as we were talking about um, a particular law student who was pregnant and the need for some accommodations in terms of her workload and exams. I remember my male colleague saying, well, we don't have to do anything. She had a choice. And you know, he was very known to be pro choice. She had a choice. She didn't have to be in this situation. Again, I wish I would have spoken out in the moment. You now, in the end, it did not derail what we were doing for her. Um, but that comment stuck with me. And it, it, it stuck with me even in writing this piece and thinking that there is something about these separate silos that is very problematic when we think about. Uh, reproductive rights in one silo and sex equality in the other silo that plays out in really harmful ways. And so, you know, my colleague um, thinking about this was a big part of the harm in having these separate doctrinal silos. That well, that's not doesn't have to be an equality issue because she had had an autonomy right to not be in this position. So this piece is really a critique. Of these separate silos of Title IX for uh, sex edu education equality, including pregnancy discrimination, and if you will, a right to not become pregnant or not stay pregnant, being put in the box of reproductive rights in the constitutional realm of liberty and privacy. And so there are some, you know, doctrinal consequences that are problematic here, but maybe even more so is the discourse and the messaging and the lack of coalition building around these issues. And so, you know, one of those deeper messages um, is that um, from the Title IX standpoint, you know, once you're pregnant, that's when sex equality law can kick in and do something about pregnancy discrimination. But before that, it's on you. It's not a sex equality issue getting pregnant under our doctrine. So with, with no foothold in Title IX to support pregnancy prevention or avoidance, um, that falls to the constitutional framework, which is what Joanne is going to talk about, which turns out to be very inadequate. So <clears throat> I'll then get into a little bit of the piece on Title IX. And the main takeaway point here <clears throat> is that Title IX only comes into play once there is the fact of pregnancy. Once pregnancy is in the picture, then we have pregnancy flagged by Title IX as a sex equality issue. Before that, Title IX has nothing to say. So uh, to back up a little bit, um, you know, probably everyone knows the statute was passed in 1972, and it's one of these very general bans on discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. Um, I'm sorry, general bans on discrimination on the basis of sex. The statute says nothing about pregnancy. Pregnancy only comes in specifically with the regulation. There is, though, a little bit of revealing legislative history around pregnancy in Title IX. The lead sponsor, Birch Bayh, 
made the point um, in debates over Title IX that if there are no educational opportunities for women, women will have too many babies. And I'm tempted to say, only a man puts it in those terms, as if opening up educational opportunities is all that's needed in the way of contraception. And it certainly reinforces an ideology of it's all on the woman. So it is her fault if she gets pregnant anyway and throws away those educational opportunities, which was basically my colleague's perspective. So the gender ideology here was inauspicious from the beginning. So the regulations come along in 1975 and uh, protect against discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. But there are a lot of carve outs here places where Title IX title is silent. So one of those is abortion. In 1987, there was a part of the statute added the so-called abortion neutrality provision, which means that there's no duty to support, educate, or provide any access to abortion. In theory, schools uh, cannot penalize someone for having an abortion, uh, that pregnancy termination is covered from discrimination. But in fact, there's no case law on this, no OCR guidance on this. And again, the overriding message here is uh, that's on you, women. Title IX has nothing to do with that. Uh, another carve out, contraception. Um, like Title VII, pre-ACA, it was an uphill battle to get any kind of contraceptive coverage in any level of health services. Sex education. That too, a carve out. Title IX has nothing to say about the curriculum on sex education, even if those programs are the abstinence only variety in which we know that those result in a higher uh, instance of unwanted pregnancy. And many of those programs support gender ideologies that are very much in tension with Title IX, including a presumption really of early marriage and early childbearing with the woman as homemaker that is contrary to the, the normative philosophy of Title IX. But Title IX is not a source of rights for changing the curriculum. And then finally, um, the article mentions sexual assault, you know, which does have some coverage under Title IX. But what it leaves out is the reproductive consequence of sexual assault. So I won't get into too much detail here, but even under the Obama um, era guidance, which was much more protective against sexual assault and what we currently have, the um, sexual assault was covered under Title IX only when the sex was unwelcome, not when sex was welcome, but reproductive consequences were not. So there has been some important work recently done on um, what's been called reproductive coercion which is an unsettlingly prevalent phenomenon with young women. Um, uh, actually, a University of Pittsburgh researcher did a study finding that one in eight high school girls have experienced reproductive coercion in a relationship where the sex is welcome, but the sexual partner is uh, interfering with contraception. Um, and the, the young woman does not want to become pregnant but her partner is interfering with her ability to not become pregnant. Um, and Title IX's rules on sexual assault do not view an unwanted pregnancy that results as um, a concern for Title IX. There is no obligation under Title IX to provide emergency contraception or abortion services or remediate that kind of a harm. So all that is to say the Title IX rights really start at the moment of pregnancy. What comes before is not treated as an issue of equality. So then um, the article looks at what are those Title IX rights with regard to pregnancy discrimination and makes the argument that they are actually quite limited, too limited to really uh, ameliorate the educational consequences. So one place to start is to think about who is the pregnant subject of Title IX rights. And the article argues that there has been a shift over years uh, about who is the imagined pregnant subject in a way that has been very harmful to Title IX rights in this area. 
you know, in the early 70s, uh, at the time that the Title IX regulation was being developed, teen pregnancy was not problematized the way it became in the 80s and 90s. It was more often thought of as um, a mistake, um, an unfortunate mistake that, uh, that, the, that the girl who was implicitly understood to be respectable we should not pay for um, with educational consequences forever. But with the discourses about teen pregnancy and especially welfare in the 80s and 90s, teen pregnancy became racialized and stigmatized um, with pregnant teens being viewed as educationally expendable and irresponsible in a way that hurt Title IX enforcement of meaningful rights. So there's an example in the article that another uh, researcher, Wanda Pillow, has written about that in 2013, the New York subway was with an educational campaign against teen pregnancy. And the messages underlying that are deeply problematic. The pictures depict um, black and brown women holding babies and everyone looks disturbed and unhappy. And the babies are ch chastising their mothers for giving them poor life futures. You had me too early, you know, I won't, it'll hurt my future earnings. And it's very much shaming um, and depicting the mother as an educational throwaway. So the Title IX rights um, are, you know, somewhat meaningful. I don't wanna overstate this, but they are certainly not enough to really address the educational consequences of pregnancy. So, um, I, won't, I don't have time to go into the detail here, but the bottom line is that the rights frame pregnancy as a temporary physical condition to be accommodated. Um, and the result is that it's a rather hollow set of rights. So one thing we did with this article is look at all of the case law involving Title IX in pregnancy since 2010. Uh, when an article had been published reviewing the case law dating back to 1972. And in that article, Michelle Gao, she found 18 cases. Well, we found only seven since 2010. And the reason there aren't very many cases is not that everything is fine. It's that it is a very difficult body of law for people to enforce their rights. And the vast majority of these cases, really all but one in our era of look, were higher ed, where the subject of Title IX rights is not presented so much as expendable, is more educationally deserving and much more likely, since many of these cases are at the grad school level, much more likely to have the resources and knowledge to be able to assert these rights. So uh, the article goes into some depth about the limits of these rights, but I'm gonna stop here and turn it over to Joanna to talk about the intersection with reproductive rights. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit <clears throat> about um, focusing on the sexual and reproductive um, issues around minors, um, which are sort of the left out portion of what Debbie is describing. Um, so the, it's very common in the reproductive rights jurisprudence for there to be like broad platitudes that tie women's reproductive autonomy to their broader equality rights or to their ability to participate fully in public life or in economic life. Obviously, Justice Ginsburg was the best at that and always sort of adding in language in pregnancy discrimination and abortion cases to try to draw those connections. But the um, trio in, um, Plant and Casey did that. And you know, you can see traces of this sense that what they're doing in the reproductive rights area has consequences for equality. But of course, doctrinally, that's not where reproductive rights um, from a constitutional perspective have been um, grounded. And that is meant that the way reproductive rights have developed constitutionally is that um, there's no obligation, right, to create conditions where women's autonomy can be recognized or where these rights that are protected can be realized. And that has consequences um, for different groups for different reasons. Um, but if we're focusing on um, the uh, 
minors here because they're the ones who Title IX in theory should be protecting, you see that gap um, really starkly that on the one hand, we have this robust set of protections it rooted in privacy. And on the other hand, what does that really look like for um, minors? And I would say my sort of insights on minors have really changed a lot since moving to Texas a little under five years ago. Um, and having lived uh, previously in the North, I was really not um, grounded in the same way that I am now in what it really looks like um, when you're in a world in which um, rights are not really protected and access is definitely not protected. And so a lot of what I think is really shaped by very concrete um, experiences here, both um, at a policy level, I work with, um, a, as uh, Emily mentioned with a group called Jane's Due Process, but I also represent um, minors in bypass um, proceedings and I do a lot of that work. And so I've had a lot of exposure to the you know, most granular level of sort of what this fight looks like. Um, but if you think about just the broader argument we make in the article about the, what the gap in Title IX means for minors is that if to the extent reproductive rights are outside sex discrimination law and rooted in an autonomy framework, that's inherently a problem for minors who are not even presumed to have decisional autonomy in the first place. So the very first thing, even in the right side, is that all of the rights regarding abortion, contraception, et cetera, get scaled down when applied to minors because we have other um, consequence of, of other things like parental rights that we have to take account of. Um, so in the context of minors, you end up with um, a, a scaled down right to begin with, and then all of the access problems that adult women have, and then you layer on top of that their own access problems, like they don't have freedom of movement, they don't have cars, they don't have money, um, and they don't have the same you know, control over any aspect of their lives. And so I'm gonna just give an example. I'm getting a note that we're already uh, running short on time. So I'm gonna give an example in the abortion bypass context that I think illustrates the broader theoretical problem that Debbie is talking about, but in a very concrete way. Um, so in the bypass proceedings and all of them nationwide look roughly this, in, at, at some level look the same because it's a constitutionally mandated standard. Um, but what it looks like on the ground, for example, is when you have a pregnant minor who wants to seek an abortion without parental consent, um, what role does her education play? And I'll tell you what role it plays where I live. If I go to a court in Dallas, um, I pitch the entire case, it's all in secret. So there's no precedential value to anything that I do, right? So if I'm in Dallas, I go to the judge and I, my entire case is about preserving the educational opportunity for this minor and how an abortion will help her achieve her educational goals in the future, right? That is always the narrative, sort of regardless of the facts, that's always the narrative. So I put on evidence about her grades and what classes she's taken and um, what she want, where she wants to go to college, whether she's taken the ACT, whether she has a career goal, and that's no matter what else, like that's always the narrative. If I move one county to the north, which I did last week, um, which is a totally, you know, it's like going from New York to Mississippi in some ways. Um, no offense to anyone here who might be from Mississippi. Um, because Texas is a lot like Mississippi. Um, but if I move one county to the north, I don't mention education at all because the judges there are offended by the idea that the girl's education is more important than the fetus's right to uh, reach viability. And in fact, been told that by um, judges in some of the neighboring counties that you can't talk about education because that's selfish. Um, and so I don't talk about education at all. And I go in and I tell a totally different story, all true, right? I don't make up facts, but my narrative is completely different. And to some extent, that's a microcosm of what minors are subjected to in this world in which their education and educational equity is sort of at best an afterthought and it's possibly even an impediment to their ability to pursue their reproductive rights. And when you add on that, the what's been done to sex ed, um, particularly in the South, um, that they don't even have the, the information or the, to enable them to 
exercise whatever decisional autonomy they have, and they don't have the contraceptive rights either. So, and I'll just end with this one last thing, which is like in Texas, again, to give just a concrete example. So I have a, a client who I've been working with to get emancipated um, because she has no parents really who do anything for her. Um, so she has, she's 17 years old and has a two-year-old and no parents who do any, you know, who she doesn't even live with a parent. Um, and her, the reality of the way these laws come together for her is she had decisional autonomy to keep that pregnancy and give birth. When she was pregnant a second time, she did not have the autonomy to decide to terminate without going to court to get permission, and which she did. Um, and now she is raising a child living alone and does not have the ability to get birth control because in Texas you need parental consent for birth control. So she can take her daughter to the pediatrician and get her daughter's medical care. She can't get medical care. She can't get a COVID vaccine. She can't get childhood immunizations because she doesn't have a parent who can consent. And she can't get birth control to prevent a future pregnancy, but she can work and raise a child. And because of all of this, can't go to school. <laughs> and that's sort of the reality of when you add all some of these things together, right? Is that we have, made it practically impossible for education to matter um, at because of the way we've constructed um, this set of, of, of rules. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Joanna and Debbie. Um, I wish we could talk about this all day. And I would encourage everyone to read Debbie and Joanna's article. It's really just fabulous. Um, and I think it's a great segue talking about um, how our rights framework really kind of isolates and obscures the reality of pregnancy and parenting. Um, and Laura Kessler will talk about how we deal with miscarriage, um, another kind of missed aspect of pregnancy next. So Laura. Well, thank you so much. Let me get my PowerPoint up here. Uh, okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Awesome. Okay, sorry, I have to do a little bit of adjusting. Okay, well, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I have not, uh, I've missed a few of your, uh, the Applied Feminism uh, conferences and I'm just so thrilled to be back. And so maybe one of the uh, silver linings of, um, of uh, the pandemic is that uh, so many of us get to participate in this amazing conference. Um, Okay, so um, this paper explores the issue of miscarriage um, in the workplace and particularly the lack of protections um, from employment discrimination for workers who experience miscarriages. Um, uh, you know, everyone knows miscarriage is a medical condition related to pregnancy. Um, so, you know, really it's, this is a, the, this paper that I'm writing or the, the problem I'm trying to address is obviously a subset of a widely recognized problem uh, that the law in federal law and, and to some of the large extent state law in the United States is just not cutting it for pregnant workers. Um, but miscarriage is also unique. Um, it presents unique legal questions and practical puzzles um, that I think deserve their own attention. Um, and that's why I decided to write this paper. Um, it's also, you know, um, I'm sure all of you, um, you know someone who's had a miscarriage or you have had one. Um, so many friends and colleagues have shared their stories with me over the years about their experiences of miscarriage um, and how it impacted them personally and how it affected their ability to perform their job. Um, and, uh, but nobody, it's like nobody talks about it, right? It's a very taboo topic. It's very private. Um, so it's a very much a largely invisible experience, um, and it, but it needs to be discussed. Uh, and so those are some of the things. And, and I guess I just want to also um, echo Deborah's uh, a point that she just made is, you know, I've written about reproductive rights, you know, so that's one bucket of my work. And the other is employment discrimination. And I think, you know, this really is this, uh, you know, theoretically, like this idea of merging reproductive uh, justice with, um, you know, discrimination law, um, all of it, right? Uh, Title IX, uh, you know, Title VII uh, is trying to think about these as not separate, uh, uh, you know, bifurcated uh, parts of, of uh, legal analysis and feminist theorizing. So uh, I really, uh, I feel like that's part of uh, what I'm trying to do as well. Um, okay, so let's just talk for a minute about uh, what, I, what I want to do now is uh, just to give some background, you know, define miscarriage and uh, give some medical information um, and talk about its prevalence and 
et cetera. So um, in the United States, a miscarriage is usually defined as the loss of a fetus before the 20th week of pregnancy. Um, the causes of many miscarriages are unknown. Uh, the biological mechanisms to explain miscarriage are, are not well understood. Uh, 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 there are certain things I won't go into the medical literature extensively, or you know, but basically, you know, individuals who experience miscarriage are often left without answers as to why their pregnancy failed. Um, the second thing is it's extremely common. Miscarriage is a very common experience. Um, of confirmed pregnancies, about 15 to 25 percent will end in miscarriage. And moreover, the risk is even higher um, or greater for certain groups of uh, individuals who become pregnant. So older uh, um, uh, individuals between the ages of 35 and 45 face more like a 35% chance of miscarriage. Uh, once you hit 40, it's about 50%. Um, uh, African-Americans have nearly a two-fold higher risk of miscarriage compared with whites um, and a 93% greater hazard for a later miscarriage. Um, obesity is correlated with miscarriage, um, uh, a prior history of miscarriage, obviously, um, and certain health conditions uh, such as polycystic ovary disease, a high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, and so the overall, uh, I guess, uh, picture we get, I think, um, from this is it's extremely common. What I want to talk about for a minute is, you know, what are the, um, what are the effects of miscarriage, right? How does it affect people who have miscarriages? Well, so first of all, most miscarriages occur early in pregnancy, so they're, uh, but they're, so they're generally invisible, right? They're in general, invisible except uh, to the person who's experienced this event um, and maybe their closest family members. Um, so that's very question of like, how does the law address miscarriage? Um, it's, very, it's really a complex biological and uh, psychological event and it has significant physical and mental health effects. So uh, it may involve considerable physical pain, uh, potentially disturbing um, uh, uh, images or uh, seeing blood and tissue, uh, hospitalization, uh, surgery, as sometimes it's required if you're, uh, uh, the uterus uh, called the uh, DNC. Um, and you know, one thing I think that is not commonly known, at least by people who don't get pregnant, is that fetal demise can occur weeks before the actual, we think of miscarriage as a moment, right? When, the, when someone, your uter a uterus expels a fetus, um, but it can be weeks, right? You could have a failed pregnancy uh, for six weeks or a month before actually um, the, uh, your body, uh, it, it, there's what we think of, you know, and I think commonly as a miscarriage, right? So, so that, uh, can, can, can create a lot of um, uncertainty and anxiety, um, knowing that you're carrying a failed, uh, you have a failed pregnancy, but you're, but you haven't, um, you're still uh, have a, a, a you're, you might still feel like you're pregnant um, um, if, because of that. So um, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that after miscarriage, most individuals uh, feel an experience of intense emotional distress, uh, typically for six weeks. Um, and some may continue to, to uh, experience depressive symptoms for months or years, right? And studies show that after suffering a miscarriage, about two thirds of people who miscarry report that they are still upset two years after the event. Um, there's a common idea that like a second uh, successful pregnancy will solve that and uh, the research does not uh, bear that out. Uh, a, a successful pregnancy after miscarriage does not um, diminish risk of uh, depression or anything like that. Um, 20% of people who uh, experience miscarriage become symptomatic for depression and anxiety with symptoms typically lasting one to three years. So uh, the big uh, point here is it's extremely common. Um, the experience is intersectional in nature. It's more likely to, to uh, be experienced by pregnant workers who are additionally vulnerable to discrimination because of other, uh, their race or health conditions. And it doesn't happen in a moment in time. It's not a one a minute or moment a day thing necessarily. Okay, so what are some of the unique challenges, you know, which, which uh, of, uh, of in this area? Okay, I want to talk some about some of the prop challenges, and I was so excited to see this conference, which is, you know, about the theme of privacy, because I don't think, because uh, this is creating a great opportunity for me to talk about this dilemma. Um, so miscarriage is a very private experience. Um, and you know, the, one of the biggest dilemmas is how do you obtain protections and accommodations at work while protecting the privacy of workers, right? So employees are often scared to tell their employers that they're pregnant and they wait as long as possible to share the news. Um, many pregnant employees, they, they hide their pregnancies because of fear of discrimination. Um, the fears are quite rational, right? Pregnant people are less likely to be hired or promoted. Um, they receive lower salaries than non-pregnant um, applicants and employees. 
Um, and uh, most people who are uh, experiencing miscarriage never tell their employers, right? So keeping a miscarriage is so secret um, as to be considered to be automatic, um, automatic, right? Uh, it's the miscarriage secret is automatic. Um, nobody, uh, oftentimes, no one ever even considers uh, sharing the information. Um, so under, so this creates a big legal challenge, right? So under Title VII and all the other major federal employment discrimination statutes, um, the employer must have notice of the facts underlying the plaintiff's claim before the plaintiff files the suit. Um, that's true, obviously, for the ADA, um, also for the Family Medical Leave Act. Now, there's case law that says that you don't have to for give formal notice. There's some good uh, cases and, and, and regulatory interpretation of both those statutes that say that, um, you know, as long as the employer knows of your medical condition or your disability or your status uh, under Title VII, um, that they, uh, you, you are protected. Um, but there, you know, people don't, they go out of their way not to share the information. Um, and they, and they, and, and so there's a big issue with privacy um, to become protected. Um, the second is retaliation. Um, we all know that a pregnancy, there's a very high correlation, um, the very big, uh, you know, retaliation, I might argue, is one of the biggest problems not getting family leave uh, is actually being retaliated, for example, after taking a family leave or retaliation for filing a discrimination claim under the PDA. Um, um, if the pregnancy was intended, at least the employee was sharing the intentions of becoming pregnant with their employer, right? They're trying to become pregnant, but they're not telling their employer. And they, they feel there's a very big risk of retaliation. And, and I guess I get one of my thoughts here is that the reward benefit, um, you know, calculation is really different. Like if you have a, a, a successful pregnancy, you tell your employer that you need a family leave or an accommodation of some type possibly. Um, but if you have a failed um, pregnancy, the, the benefit of telling your employer, you most, it's just all, all a risk, but the benefit, there's not gonna be um, um, necessarily a, 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 a baby, right? Um, so, so and, and also there's a practical problem, which is that um, you only get 12 weeks of family medical leave um, per year. Um, so if you use family leave for a serious medical condition like a miscarriage that will eat into your leave um, if there's subsequently a, a healthy pregnancy and a birth. Um, so, and then finally, and I think this is one thing I really wanna uh, work on in, a, in this paper, and I don't think there's been at least enough attention to this in the, in the I definitely in the press, but not in the legal uh, literature, uh, in, in legal and in, in, in theorizing about this problem. Is work itself is a risk of miscarriage, okay? Especially for workers in low wage and physically demanding jobs, right? Uh, uh, people, who work in warehouses, uh, food processing plants, in the health industry, uh, nursing and retirement homes, uh, lifting uh, bodies and pay, uh, et cetera, care providers um, are, uh, it, there, it, that itself is a, is a risk of uh, work itself for suffering a miscarriage. Okay, so um, I wanna tell a story uh, to illustrate this of um, um, uh, Siadria Walker. Uh, she was a warehouse worker for XPO Logistics which is a global freight and shipping company. Um, XPO is the largest provider of last mile shipping of heavy goods in North America, right? They arrange for the home delivery of heavy goods that typically require assembly or installation like washing machines and refrigerators, exercise equipment, home entertainment systems. Um, she often worked 12 hour shifts at XPO's Memphis warehouse. And when her doctor advised her not to lift more than 50 pounds and reduce her hours on her feet, she presented a doctor's note to her supervisor and the request was ignored. And this is all too common. We heard uh, this, um, this was the issue um, in the Supreme Court in UPS, uh, the UPS case uh, where there was a lifting restriction that was not respected for the plaintiff. Um, th th her supervisor ignored her request and we, not only that, but he basically uh, punished her and he routinely asked her to work in what was called a pit, which was giving her uh, the most heavy boxes to handle. Um, she thought about leaving her job, but she couldn't quit her job and she needed um, the income, right? Um, so one day after a long shift of handling the, these heavier box, boxes, um, she miscarried. Um, so this is an all too common story. Um, five workers in this particular warehouse, um, at, since in the, the five, in the like three or four years before she miscarried, um, had also been refused light duty work and miscarried. Okay, so um, I already touched a little bit on the different statutes, but you know, miscarriage potentially implicates um, several employment uh, statutes, including Title VII as amended by the PDA, Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the Family Medical Leave Act, uh, the ADA, Americans with Disability Act, and also the Occupational Safety and Health Act. 
Um, I think we're running out of time, so I'm just going to touch very briefly. But the, the overall uh, point of my paper is that you would think, right, that uh, miscarriage would be covered by uh, these laws, but they re it really the experience slips through the cracks of all of the major federal employment discrimination and employment statutes. Um, the PDA uh, defines sex discrimination to include pregnancy and related medical conditions. Um, um, and it employers, it, it prevents obviously employers from taking an adverse employment action against an employee for any of these bases who are capable of performing their job duties, uh, which is sort of the non-discrimination mandate. Um, the PDA also, uh, it requires employers to treat pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions as they do other temporary disabilities. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm not going to talk, Young is so convoluted, the Young case, this is a Supreme Court case a few years ago, where the Supreme Court tried to uh, clarify what the legal standard is under the PDA for uh, get accommodations um, that are um, uh, the same as those who, who are, uh, or some others who are similarly situated in their ability or inability to work. And it's just, you know, the lower courts are still thoroughly confused by the Young standard. Um, all, what I want to say here is, um, without getting too much into it, is that the, the, the court in Young imposes a higher evidentiary burden for pregnant workers who are seeking um, the same temporary disability um, accommodations as non-pregnant workers, um, an extra high evidentiary standard where they have to have extra you know, really close comparators or, or a, a class type evidence to show everyone else in the workplace who has a, temp a similar disability is uh, getting a, um, a, an accommodation, but the pre uh, pregnant workers are being burdened and not. Um, so. Uh, Basically, uh, the, the cases aren't great. Um, I looked at uh, three groups of cases. I, I just want to tell you uh, what they are. Um, and let's see, get my... So the three uh, classes of cases I looked at under the PDA are uh, the bed, bed rest cases. Um, so bed rest is probably the most commonly prescribed intervention for preventing a miscarriage. Um, some low bed rest therapy is actually recommended for 20% of pregnancies. Um, the other category I'm looking at are, uh, and I'm not done with this paper, are um, cases dealing with depression or anxiety um, or mental health effects following a miscarriage. Um, and the third is uh, workers undergoing fertility treatment because of multiple miscarriages. Um, the majority of women um, or people who become pregnant um, who, uh, who need uh, 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 undergo IVF, um, they require some time off of work. The most common reason is for medical appointments followed by physical and emotional difficulties. Um, and, you know, if you look at these cases, um, the plaintiffs have not fared so well in any of these categories. Um, in the bed rest cases, uh, here's a quote from one of the cases, an employer must ignore employee's pregnancy, but not her absence from work. Uh, and the depression uh, uh, cases, courts have held the depression after miscarriage is not a medical condition related to pregnancy. Um, and I'm still looking at the fertility cases, and I, I might take them out of the paper because I, I guess there's been already been a lot of writing about fertility in the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. Okay, I basic, think I'm basically out of time. Uh, I'll just tell you that um, a miscarriage is considered to be a serious um, health condition under the Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, so in theory, it should be covered, um, but there's some problems or practical problems. So, so first of all, um, if, you're, if your serious medical condition is a mental uh, or psychological um, injury, it's, it's generally very hard to, uh, harder, I would say, to be qualified for family leave. Um, the other issue is partners. There's a lot of research that shows that partners of those who lose uh, 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 have a miscarriage um, ha suffer grief uh, as well as the person who goes through the physical event. Um, and it's quite uh, difficult for partners of, of those who suffer miscarriages to get family leave to care for or, and also to deal with their own um, uh, mental, uh, uh, um, the consequences maybe depression. Um, and then, as I said, saving leave for future pregnancies is a big problem um, with the FMLA because you only get 12 weeks um, and then, um, okay, the a ADA, um, I think I'm out of, basically, I'm looking at the chat. Am I out of, am I out of time? Yeah, we're, we're at time, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I hate to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay, so let me just, uh, the ADA uh, has, was uh, improved uh, in 2008 uh, to broaden the definition of disability. Um, it, it's been improved, uh, there, it basically uh, accommodations are, should be uh, given for at least not for normal pregnancy, but for medical conditions related to pregnancy after the ADA was amended in 2008. But I looked at those cases too, and I can maybe in the Q&A tell you some of those, but the courts, the courts are still split about whether bed rest is like a medical, uh, miscarriage is a medical condition under the ADA. 
Um, okay, and so I guess uh, the question is the solutions. Uh, you can just look at my slide, but you know, I, I don't know. I'm still puzzling through this, but the Pregnancy Workers Fairness Act would require employers to provide reasonable accommodations for pregnancy but without having to find comparators, um, like an extra bathroom break or a stool or limiting contact with working with chemicals or re re lifting uh, re uh, restrictions. Um, so that's a very, could solve a lot of this, right? Um, the second is just sick leave. I, I, I'm puzzling through this privacy problem. And I, um, I think if you, if people just, if workers just had the right to have personal or paid sick leave without having to give any reason at all, um, that would solve a lot of this. Um, possibly a private right of action uh, if confidentiality is breached by the employer. Uh, right now, there's no private right of action, um, and maybe tort law. So that's uh, that's everything. And thank you so much. I'm sorry I went over by maybe a minute. Yeah, thank you, Laura. That was great. Um... Next, we, and again, just um, for everyone in the audience, please feel free to put comments and questions in the chat. I will be saving them for the Q&A. Um, up next, we have Anibal Rosario Lebron, um, who will be talking about weaponizing civil liberties, a crisis lens analysis to sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation equality. Um, so um, Anibal, take it away. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you for everyone who is, uh, or in the organizing of this great conference. I'm so happy that we were able to do it uh, even in the in the Zoom world. So as somebody was saying, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the weaponization of civil liberties. And what I was thinking is we have been for over a century experiencing a change in contestation about patriarchy, gender binarism, uh, and gender conformity, right? Among other things. Um, but every time that we have these changes, it comes to a contestation. So I was trying to understand that contestation that comes from the, the patriarchy access, right? And part of that is looking at, I'm looking specifically at the case law, right? And how we can see that in the case law, but also at the litigation strategies that some groups are putting to put a halt into the, the rights of uh, sex equality, gender equality, and sexual orientation equality. So one of those is the, uh, to multiply control over the courts. There is also an amplification of constitutional protection statutorily. And by that, I mean REFRA, for example. Um, we have seen, and I'm gonna go into more detail when I discuss this, the adoption of minority constitutional frameworks that were used to advance civil rights now being used to put a halt on those civil rights. And uh, with that, it also comes at the speaking of uh, a nascent minority for religious groups or for other groups. Also a reshaping of bigotry and misogyny narratives uh, if they were not there in that type of litigation. And we also seen a type of a temporary embrace of outcomes in favor of minorities. And, and I'll use the example of Bostock in this case. We have also seen an adoption of the litigation strategies by minorities by creating and Susan Hazel, uh, Hazel Dean talk about this, the ADF, right, creating this type of, of work. And here you see a graphic of something that we all know about how the conservative judges have been packing the courts, right, by the government. Uh, and that's a trend. We also have seen a trend in the creation of refer status, for example. And here you see half, half of the country have refer status right now. So um, that comes uh, at a, a higher risk for not only LGBTQ people, but also for women in terms of uh, reproductive rights and discrimination in public accommodations, for example. So you see how that is also divided in terms of, of the country. And I wanna talk about how these strategies have been coming to health. And the first one that I'm gonna use and I'm gonna uh, play uh, a, a part of a video here is to talk about religious freedom. And this is one ex example of that. When I explained to my principal that I couldn't in good conscience pronounce masculine pronouns to refer to a girl, he gave me a, an official written reprimand and said it was the first step in a process that would lead to my termination. The ultimatum said that in order for me to be allowed back in the classroom, that I would have to proactively use male pronouns to designate the students.
I had Mr. Vlaming as a student in his French class for three years. I think what I liked about having Mr. Vlaming as a teacher was I felt like he was there, like he really wanted me to learn French. And if I ever had a problem with French or not, he would always be there for me. He was my French teacher for five years, all through high school. Actually from eighth grade, all through high school. It was really fun. We never had a dull moment in a class. We used to call people over in France that he knew because he lived over there. And we'd have to make up questions we wanted to ask. And we do that like once a month at least. <laughs> He was really funny, and he was the same to every student. So here you can see in the video a, a couple of things, right? And, and as you see, it's a, it's a professor who is refusing to use the right pronoun of a student. Uh, but uh, Eddie have been perfectioning the litigation strategies, creating media content from all of these high profile cases. And one of is how they depict the litigants. And you see that it's, it's not, a depiction of masculinity uh, or traditional masculinity as we want. And further in the video, he goes into explaining how he was uh, willing to refer to the student as you, right? But he wanted, he did not want to use the pronoun outside uh, the classroom in any way or to call the student by the, the male pronoun. And a lot of these cases, and oops, let me make sure. A, a lot of these cases that you're, you're seeing uh, are not coming only in this area. They have a, a great litigation strategy that comes from all of them in a way that it's, it's almost imperceptible how well organized they have become in creating these uh, litigation strategies. And I'm going to show you a list of some of those cases so that you get an idea of how many cases they have uh, have been able to prove to ADF and how successful they have been in doing so um, throughout probably 25 years. So here you have some of, of them, right? Uh, depriving same-sex families the right to raise their children or to have a family, uh, restricting access to reproductive medical services, um, the one about the pronouns, uh, refusing uh, public accommodations. And the same is happening in cases of free speech. And for me, one of the uh, most uh, salient examples of that is one of the most recent cases in terms of- The petitioners rights. in this case are pro-life pregnancy centers and the respondents are state officials of the state of California. Sorry. Legally at issue in this case is the ability of the state to regulate professional speech or conduct and whether or not they may essentially compel a message that is contrary to the beliefs of the speakers. In 2015, California enacted the Reproductive Fact Act. The Fact Act imposes two disclosure requirements on pregnancy centers in California. Crisis pregnancy centers are organized with the purpose of giving aid to pregnant mothers in the hopes that they will choose life for their unborn child. Some of the crisis pregnancy centers are licensed medical facilities and they provide sonograms and ultrasounds, prenatal services. The unlicensed centers tend to provide more parenting counseling, assistance for raising a child, diapers, clothing, that type of support. So um, then again, you can see how they are portrayed in these cases and this goes into free exercise. And one of the most important things that I see from uh, this type of litigation is that they are focusing on the interests of the states, right? And we don't get to see the interests of the woman on getting information and not getting uh, misled by uh, these crisis centers, right? That they provide abortion services uh, and they go trying to terminate the pregnancies and they are not able to that. But for the court, that doesn't come into the equation, right? Because it's the state of the, it's the interest of the state, what is at place against uh, a right uh, of free exercise in this case for uh, the, the centers. And that creates um, imbalance that in other jurisdictions doesn't happen because we get to see that these are in reality 
between two private individuals trying to assert their rights. And uh, some jurisdictions have what is an horizontal application of the constitution that we don't have in the United States because of the requirement of the state action. Um, and that is also part of the strategy, right? Using the state action in, in their favor uh, all of the time. And then again, this is not the only case that you will see. Um, there are many cases in this type of of free speech. Um, you have Schwartz, you have Telescope, um, Becerra, and you can see how there is a trend, right, on giving more cases to conservative speech than before, um, and how the court has become more divided. And scholars have pointed out this, they have talked about this, justices also have talked about this issue, and legislatures are aware, for example, in New York, uh, they put a halt into um, the decision to prohibit conversion therapy because they were afraid of the results of that litigation by using free speech and free religion uh, and free exercise. Another trend has been to use the animal doctrine that was used to protect uh, groups against uh, moral judgments to be used in these type of cases by saying that they are becoming this nascent minority uh, pretty much. And a way of doing that, and this is part of that erasure of the bigotry is shown in this video that was prepared for another litigation with this telescope. As we kind of lived out our lives and time went on, we just found this overarching theme in our lives that we love marriage. And so we've had people on our couch several times, premarital counseling, talking about how do I do this? How do I love my spouse? Even officiating weddings, because we just really believe in the institution of marriage. We believe having convictions causes us to move towards people that are different from us. We love having a diverse group of people around our table. I feel like it makes our lives richer. Our table is the central focus of our house. It's 12 feet long and the first time you come, you get to sign your name underneath it with a Sharpie. It's so fun to be able to lay underneath it and just see all the hundreds and hundreds of names. There's people around our table regularly who are very, very different from us and who hold different political views, different religious backgrounds, or members of the LGBT community. We love it. We love having people in our home who don't agree with so you see how they are trying to erase uh, those narratives, right, of bigotry or misogyny by uh, selecting these litigants, right, that seem to embrace a, di a different narrative. But at the end, uh, the purpose is to put a halt into the rights of uh, uh, minorities. And the same can be seen in Bostock, right? And if you think of Bostock, the court included in the decision the rights, uh, the, the, the discrimination against sex includes a discrimination based on gender identity and gender expression. However, it's kind of, in, in my view, uh, very dangerous uh, precedent because it talks about conflating gender, sex, uh, gender identity, gender expression into sex, which we have been fighting against all this time to put up uh, about it. Right. And I think I have a, uh, one minute left, so I'm just going to talk about what is it that I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to understand this to uh, the lens of Gramsci and the understanding that um, he talks about what is known about the interregnum. And is this um, point of inflection in the consultation process of these narratives in the law and in the social sphere? And what he's telling us by trying to understand fascism is that in that case, what we need to be looking is to how we organize, right? And how we do it so that this is not the place that we go back, but that we move forward, right? And he talks about this crisis and he describes what we are doing or experiencing right now as an organic and explicit crisis. And in that crisis, uh, we have to come to organize and come with a strategy so that we don't let the right take our narratives and you said it again so so i'm trying to think about and this is the the part of apply how does this translate to the application in practice of organizing ourselves against this practice and my solution to that and just let me make sure that i can share it with you 
is that we think about uh, some of the strategies that they have used, right? Um, like repacking the course. Uh, some people might want to think about changing the, the narratives about the, the course themselves and what to do, right? Revert to less expansive in, interpretations, look at about abolishing the state action and also amplifying constitutional pro protections to legislative action. So having laws like REFRA, but that protects, for example, reproductive rights and uh, requires, and this will be done at a state level, require a higher scrutiny if we are trying to somehow curtail the reproductive rights of women or discriminate against groups because their sex, gender, identity of gender expression. And hopefully I met it on time, Emily. Yes, thank you so much, Anibal. That was great. Um, I know you sped through a little bit, but we um, are excited to read more as you develop um, your thoughts. And it's just so important to be thinking about, you know, the backlash when we do make progress um, and how kind of framing um, autonomy and a rights framework can kind of open it up to um, that assertion of rights on the other side. Um, so our final presenter, our final panelist is Lynn Liu. Um, I know we're running a little over time, but I hope people will stick around and have some questions for the panelists um, since this is the last panel of the day. So Lynn will be talking about restorative relationships and radical help in the context of um, welfare. So Lynn, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'm not going to use my PowerPoint slides uh, in part because everyone else's slides are much better than mine. And also because um, some of those videos gave me the heebie-jeebies. And so I feel like I'm just going to be a talking head. So I apologize for that. Those were like so well curated. Um, and in fact, I was sitting here trying to imagine like what would the video ad look like for the programs or the, the mo experimental models that I'm gonna be talking to you about today. Um, this whole uh, symposium and today's panel have just been so generative and just really um, exciting for me. So I, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, the, the, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a, a turn because the, the area that I work in, welfare rights and workfare, um, is an area where uh, there, there are not very many legal protections. I, I think people realize that there just is not any kind of um, legally enforceable right to welfare. Um, and in fact, to the contrary, the welfare statutes at the federal level and as many of the states have chosen to implement them are full of things to say about uh, sex education and contraception and uh, family choices and regulation. And it's all about how if you exercise those choices in a certain way, you are excluded from uh, the social safety net and you are no longer part of the deserving poor. Uh, so um, the, the focus of my inquiry was really about when we have this paucity of social safety net programs and even before the pandemic, just under the Trump administration's agenda, um, you know, the, uh, the, the restrictions on the social safety net were, were just um, accelerating. Um, and even post administration change and as the, pan, as the vaccination uh, campaign is rolling out, um, some of the temporary measures that have been passed to address pandemic problems um, have run into some of the same kinds of ideological and political resistance that, that we've seen over decades. Um, but I was trying to look at, even before the pandemic began, what, what are some of the visions that, um, that advocates have tried to come up with for a, a different mechanism, short of uh, constitutional revolution and, and short of uh, greater political support uh, to pass different legislation? Um, and so two of the models where I found 
the most amount of serious detail and attention given were in these areas of restorative justice and a relational form of welfare, um, what the proponent calls radical help. Uh, restorative justice was applied to the workfare context by Professor Mif Marie Failinger, uh, who has written around uh, poverty law issues for a long time. She was very interested in looking at um, restorative justice and, and how it might tackle the very punitive workfare programs um, that, that, uh, that find people facing reductions in a very minimal amount of safety net assistance. And then a British designer who had a, a career's worth of experience working in international development um, and also had a, um, a design background, Hilary Cottam wrote a book called Radical Help um, which outlines her view of how harnessing technology and returning to the human strength of relationships and interpersonal relationships could actually um, cut through a lot of the bureaucratic waste and impersonal bureaucracy that has really um, prevented poor people from flourishing in society. And she's trying to um, turn the lens back to what humans have as their strength and not necessarily um, humans in relationship with family members defined in a very patriarchal uh, heterosexist way, but in the sense of um, finding kinship among like-minded people who might have uh, different uh, shared affinities with each other. And through that um, organic sense of relationship building could develop into you know, mutual aid networks or local neighborhood um, cooperatives. So she's really trying to cut through a lot of administrative process. And so these two models um, present to me some really, uh, good reasons to be optimistic about harnessing empathy and um, understanding of the reality of human lives, um, but also uh, trying to remain cautious about a need for some kind of rule of law framework that would protect against uh, a return or a domestication of um, people's attempts to help themselves, right? And so we're trying to kind of walk this tightrope between um, falling into a trap of uh, deserving poor um, people. If only we give them jobs, if only we give them access to greater education, they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And we're also trying to, to avoid falling into the other gutter of um, if only people would just stay home more and if only people would just take greater care of each other, um, you know, then, then we would be able to, to actually um, realize the, the individual preferences that we all have. And we all know very well that, that caregiving remains gendered and that uh, returning to the workforce after pregnancy or after any kind of um, medical uh, issue or um, uh, you know, time away from the workplace, it's, it's very difficult to get, to get back um, on your feet if you still face discrimination, job segregation, low wages, and, and all of those things. Um, so the models really try to take seriously the idea that people can help each other and don't have to fall into dependency on the government, right? And there's this narrative of distrust of the government. Um, and I think one of the, the um, concerns that people have had in the pandemic is simply that um, the, the flexibility and ability of government 
to to meet really urgent needs is is hampered by bureaucracy, right? And um, so that's a very realistic concern. I just want to add here that my perspective on this work is is really um, driven by my work with law students and my work with law students who are uh, representing uh, college students who rely on workfare as they're trying to, to get their college degrees. When I've asked students to go through an exercise to kind of think through why, why do you think um, someone might say to a college student, you shouldn't waste your time this would be the expendable college student, right? You shouldn't waste your time. You have kids. You shouldn't be in college. You should take the first available low paid job and, you know, let your kids have a future. You know, it's totally that narrative of uh, you made a bad choice. Um, you're not going to be able to benefit from, from higher education. When I ask the students, why would someone deprive um, a single parent of the opportunity to stabilize their family. Can you imagine what that other person might be thinking? I've asked students to do an empathy mapping exercise. And um, I, I'm not really sure what to make of this, but sometimes they will come back and say, I, I don't want to do this exercise because even though I can imagine what another person feels, I don't want to judge their response. And I don't want to fix my projection of what they might be thinking in a way that would be prejudicial or stereotypical. And so I think my goal in writing through this work was really to try to tackle that, um, that concern and to try to think about um, individual choices and autonomy in a very different way it can change. It doesn't have to be fixed. The choices you make today are not necessarily the ones that you know you might make in a different context. Um, and so the, towards the end of the paper, I'm trying to think about, well, even if we have um, concerns and um, uh, cautions in these experimental models, um, is there a way that they can help us think think our way towards a legal framework, a political framework, an interpersonal way of relating to each other that would really break through some of those restrictions that have just been so entrenched in our um, view of how to um, think about a social safety net. So if we stop thinking about human progress as this kind of linear march towards financial independence. If we stop thinking about outcomes as um, quantifiable measures, if we start thinking about the outcome as the relationship and the networks and the process that we're all involved with in trying to survive and thrive in society, what would that look like? And so that led me towards you know, looking towards um, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality and uh, just trying to, to rethink um, uh, how can we talk about autonomy when individual choices and even the information that people have access to in order to make those choices are so constrained and so limiting. Um, I think that's a little bit of a, a rambling introduction to what the work is, but I would be happy to take questions and to hear comments from folks based on the writing. Um, and yeah, just so happy to have had this symposium take place at last. Thank, well, thank you so you much. Thank you so much, Lynn. That's a, what a great way to end the panel with a little bit of an uplift there and, uh, and thinking about how we can reshift this framework. Um, I was really struck by this idea that, you know, autonomy in the legal framework that we that we usually place it in is you make this choice, you have a right to make this choice, but we don't, we kind of separate that from the accessibility of choices and the consequences of those choices. Um, and I'm really struck by 
the the way that you've kind of framed this to to be a little bit more imaginative about how we how we think about how we choose to live our lives and how we can make that more equitable for everyone. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, we, and we have a question for the panel. So many of these talks highlight the ways in which law does not meet the needs of women, even when laws are written with the goal of gender equality. Um, what accounts for this gap and how do we overcome it? Maybe we'll start with Debbie. Any ideas there? I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, no, I was hoping you wouldn't spot with me. That's such a huge question. I'm really sort of struggling about where to begin. I mean, you know, I mean, to go back and think about Title IX, remember the comment from Birch Bayh, that, and he was credited as being the father of Title IX, you know, what passes for mainstream feminism in 1972 and yet that remark to me is so problematic to think that if you give if you don't give women education they'll have too many babies that's why women deserve equal education you know for that to be sort of what the lead sponsor is thinking about when the law is passed not that legislative intent determines everything by any means um you know feminism has always been about a lot more than just legal rights and I think, you know, there's a deeper relation there between law and discourse and public understanding. And, you know, one, one productive thing the law can do is help mobilize, help, um, help frankly, educate, um, and that the limits of the law would be a spark of a feminist movement that can improve <laughs> the law and the on the ground realities. So that's, a, that's the long the long work that's always to be done with the law. I'm afraid that's as good as I can do it on a Friday afternoon. Can't solve all the problems of the world <laughs> in, in, in one minute. Um, but thank you so much. Any, Lynn, did you yeah, have? I, I, I think, you know, the part of the response that, um, that advocates have, particularly around poverty law and um, the feminization of poverty and the racialization of, of poverty is this idea that, you know, the law is not supposed to do things that affirmatively, you know, um, put you on a certain path, right? That would be too, that would be, that would be going too far, right? And so instead, we're just going to abandon people to their own devices. Um, and 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 so if you if if you either take that as the correct path, you have to come up with some kind of solution um, that is actually going to be workable. Um, and if you believe that that's somewhat of the of the incorrect interpretation of what the law could do to actually bolster a social safety net. Um, then you're faced with motivating people. You know, there's always this question of like, well, people will just be too lazy. They'll just get too comfortable. They won't come up with any ideas. And that's where I think the design, the sort of design mentality and this kind of idea of like people talking together can, can actually generate creative solutions in private, they can negotiate with each other for different solutions. And so there's a little bit of a kernel of that, like, oh, we're just gonna let that bubble up, right? But I think we need to have the framework around it to make sure that it does happen in a way where people can really actually feel supported so that once you do make the choice, you go into an educational setting, you don't then get completely crushed and have your expectations um, completely limited. Is there a way that we could draft legislation that would be passed right now? Um, that's an open question, I think. Very good can point. I just jump in? Yes, please. Um, I mean, in, in a bad way, right, we're going to have the opportunity to recreate all this from scratch, right? Because the Supreme Court's between the um, GOP and the Senate and the Supreme Court, right there, they will successfully dismantle the entirety of the existing um, rights. And I really believe that is what's happening. So um, 
in the short term, that's terrible. In the longer term, it's a forced opportunity to think about how to build it better in rooted in the quality framework, um, which maybe should have been done all along. But um, I think we're going to have no choice but to try to think about securing um, rights and access. Um, and I think the reproductive justice framework is really incredibly useful and needs to be more a part of the planning as opposed to an afterthought that just the way it happened in time um, to really think from the beginning about how to keep rights and access joined rather than thinking about them as two totally separate issues. Um, so, you know, maybe some future lemonade out of uh, a really uh, powerful batch of lemons that we're about to get hit with. Yeah. <laughs> um not super uplifting, but a good, good segue to this question we have in the chat for Anibal. Um, Anibal, do you think we should move away from a rights framework entirely? I mean, I, I think what Joanna was saying it is it, it's part of it, right? Like, um, I think it will be difficult because it is ingrained in the way that we have fought our system. So it is it is difficult in that way to to change that narrative, right? Especially when we look at, at, at liberal movements, right? We we do believe in rights, um, but I think we need to understand that rights are malleable in the way that you can change the narratives behind it, as the the right has been doing, right? So they have been changing what it means. So we can change that. I do think we need to rethink the way that we look at this balancing because every time that we put the, the state and it is interesting because in all of these cases is the state is trying to get to a more equal way of doing things right and then you have a citizen challenging that right to put a halt in the quality of another group so we need to start rethinking of the way that we can actually look at those those two rights, right? Are those two people are right holders without the state being there and looking at through the state. Because every time we put the state, we created this mythical fissure that we are afraid of. And we're gonna side with the with the side that is not the state, right? For the most part. So we need to rethink that. And I think states, other other nations have been doing that. But yeah, uh, uh, and that is not to say that we need to also include in our battery of um, tools other type of frameworks that legislative would get us there that are not necessarily rights, right? That will get that type of, of achieve those type of goals. Thank you so much. And that is also a good segue to this question from Nicole McConlogue, um, talking about the pretty offensive rationales that sometimes underlie systems, like Debbie was talking about the Title IX framework based on this assumption that you know, we don't want women to have more children, um, and maybe they'll get an education if they have fewer children. Um, so it seems like marginalized demographics are constantly just having to accept um, these justifications that underlie these frameworks. Um, and how do we forge ahead with making change without these gross assumptions and rationales for you know, laws that we want to take advantage of? I'll just say quickly, it, it does seem like that kind of change takes more than rewriting a law, passing a law. It takes deep social movements that change understandings, whether it's the feminist movement or Black Lives Matter or Me Too. Um, I mean, I really do think like that, that kind of real change takes that dialectic between social movements and law, not just electing a better legisl legislature to get something through. Yeah. yeah, and that that also reminds me of just the the way that um, a greater transformative justice movement is really taking on like what what do we want the entire society to look like as opposed to you know some kind of small narrow narrow dispute. Sorry, Anibal, I saw your. No, no, don't worry. So, so yeah, I, I would say, and, and that is a bit related to the, what I was speaking in terms of Gramsci, that he sees this world in terms of having this axis in which the state forces us, and then we have 
the other axis in which we believe in, right, with Ecos Hegemony, which is basically social media, schools, all of that, right? And we need to work on transforming that, right? Um, changing the narratives in the in in social media, changing the narrative in television, also working on education reforms to bring gender perspective into the curriculum so that we are able to change the discourses that actually shape the law. Uh, but we cannot dissociate one with the other, right? Because thinking that just law reform is going to do it, it's, it's a mistake if we don't change how people think about these issues. And the law is not going to make that change. It's not going to change the, the mentality of people. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. Um, we're kind of seeing as we look at how the law has operated the limits to what we can do as a matter of just legislation and policy um, and looking at this broader like how do we operate as people in a society um, and and make equity a part of all of our lives um, so I think that's about time we're running about 10 minutes over um, and thank you so much to our panelists this has been really fantastic um, and just thinking about autonomy in, in new ways in the context of um, the lived experiences of, of the people we work with um, and our communities. Um, so I will turn it over to Michelle Gilman. Thanks. I just want to say a brief thank you to all our panelists today and to our audience members, especially those of you who are still with us. We really appreciate your joining us. And I know I speak on behalf of Professor Johnson in that extending you all those thanks as well. You know, as I reflect back on all that I've learned today, and of course I'm still absorbing so many profound lessons, I have like four quick takeaway points that I'll offer to you all. And the first is that we really cannot theorize the meaning of privacy without taking into account the experiences of real people. And we've heard about this so much today from trans people, women prisoners, residents of public housing, pregnant women, female students, women who've suffered miscarriages, and so on and so forth. And that leads to my second point that those real life experiences should inform legal interpretation, new policies and remedies. Third, I'm more convinced than ever that privacy itself does not have a fixed meaning. We give it meaning. We want to generate good privacy, right? That enhances values of dignity and autonomy so that we can live the lives of our own choosing. But we don't want bad privacy, right? That we've heard about today, such as spaces where abuse flourishes without intervention. We need a balance and we should be the people striking that balance, we the people. And so my fourth point and one that was highlighted earlier today by our keynote speaker is that we all have a collective interest in privacy. Privacy is not an individual interest only. We all benefit from the autonomy and dignity that privacy can secure. And when privacy interests are stripped from the most disadvantaged people among us, um, those sort of tactics and technologies and surveillance systems and right stripping usually trickle up. And so Privileged people ignore these practices at their peril. Vulnerable people are the testing grounds for privacy stripping norms and ideas. And so to conclude, I wanna thank all our panelists for challenging us to consider the meaning of privacy, the value of privacy, and to propose really concrete reforms to harness privacy for good. And with that, we bid you farewell. We hope to see you at future events on the Center in Applied Feminism. Please keep in touch with us. Check out our website. Feel free to email Professor Johnson or me anytime with your ideas. Margaret, do you want to say a quick word of goodbye? Goodbye. Thank <laughs> that you. That was quick and effective. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Have a lovely weekend. And thank you for joining us.